Right. I can hear you, but I hardly count. No one else can. Okay, can people hear me now? Um, can everyone hear me now? I'll just wait for the stream to catch up and let me know. Hopefully. It'd be really oh. annoying if I have to um, right. <laughs> switch it off and switch it back on again. Um, right, okay. Uh, apparently yes, yes, right. So that solved that problem. Cool. <sighs> right, no, right. Yeah. Technical problems aside, sorry about that. Hello, everybody on the stream. Um, as you can see, uh, today we have a very special guest on the stream, and uh, that is, of course, um, now hang on. Let me just make sure I get my directions correctly. Yeah, that way, <laughs> the one and only John Partial, um, one half of the author team behind Shattered Sword. So shockingly enough, uh, if you hadn't already guessed from the title of the stream, we're going to be talking about Midway. And uh, if anyone's bothered to read the uh, stream description, of course, um, we'll obviously uh, John will be answering questions about Midway. Uh, You've got about, I think you said about 90 minutes or so that you can afford for this. Um, and uh, I, and then, yeah, and any, and uh, yeah, the other thing, of course, is that any uh, super chat revenue from this stream will, of course, be going to John because he is the, um, the guest, Woohoo! Uh, which is good. So um, let's see what questions are coming in. About Midway, because obviously, as as we were saying just before we all went live, this is the Midway season. So, right. uh, everybody, if you want to chime in with your questions about Midway, we'll see who gets in first. <laughs> Actually, I, you know, before we kick things off formally, I, I also wanted to share with you um, just a little of the sort of cutting edge research that I've been doing on the battle. Um, if if you're game, Alex. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I've recently been reviewing uh, a new book manuscript by uh, Craig Simons, who's a friend of mine, and he points out in one of his chapters that actually Chester Nimitz was very fond of having his staff of officers over to his quarters, and he liked to mix a drink uh, for his officers, and one of his favorites uh, was a self-made creation called a sink pack for CNC Pacific Fleet. <laughs> And uh, Craig very kindly shared the recipe uh, in chapter 10 of his book, and so I've been trying to, you know, work on that at home. And I just wanted to share it with our viewers because I think it would get us into the right frame of mind. <laughs> um, 
you know, you start out with uh, Demerara, Sugar Cube, a uh, couple dashes of Angostura, and, you know, we're not going to go with the Shishi Fee Brothers or the other bougie kind of bitters. This is what they had in the 1940s is Angostura. And then uh, two ounces of bourbon and an ounce of dark rum on top of that. And, and the result is uh, and, and prolific ice as well. And so you basically end up with a bourbon rum slushy. And uh, I will be sipping this very, very slowly during a <laughs> But this is the kind of you know stuff that you got to do to stay current with the scholarship, and I just want people to know that I'm that I'm there for them in that respect. Fair enough. That sounds like a very good plan. Um, I must admit, I um, I I went off with uh, I I did an experiment with torpedo juice that that did not end well. Ooh. Yeah, I can believe that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the the vague, vague and deeply worrying sensation of being there with all your mental faculties as the rest of your limbs shut down <laughs> is not not good. <laughs> not good. All right, um, what do we got? Right, so the um, the first question we've got is from Scooter JSP, and he asks if the Japanese Navy had won the battle somehow and captured Midway, how long could yeah. they reasonably have expected to hold it, and would the U.S. have been likely to simply blockade it for the duration of the war, or actually? physically retake it and i should just start out with our sort of blanket proviso on counterfactual history mm -hmm. in general in that uh yeah i don't have a crystal ball that's big enough um i don't think anybody does i will tell you that um nimitz immediately before the battle explicitly said to his task force commanders you know if they end up taking midway we're going to be able to take it back they can't keep it in supply and so my sense is that we would have um, used submarines to make sure that, you know, the place was was blockaded. They wouldn't be able to get uh, supplies into it. We certainly would have used B-17s uh, to be pounding the airstrip there, which, you know, frankly, these two islands together are about the size of a postage stamp. So it's going to be pretty tough to, you know, uh, put any sort of sizable defenses uh, on the place. So my guess is that we would have blockaded it for a certain amount of time and then we would have uh, physically invaded it and taken it back. Fair enough. Um, so uh, John Ski asks, what was the best Japanese naval attack plane um, at Midway and why? Val, Kate, or AN Other, <laughs> if they had AN Other available? Well, you can, you can make an edge case uh, for the fact that Soryu had a, uh, at least one of the new uh, D-4Y uh, dive bombers uh, that was used as a scout plane uh, rather than a, than a dive bomber. Um, that's a really interesting question, actually. I, I feel like a, you kind of have to go with the VAL. Uh, it was a, a very reliable, robust plane, um, and, you know, the Kate was also uh, showing a little sh a little of its age at this point, and torpedo planes just in general were extremely vulnerable uh, to fighter attack. So I'd, I'm going to give the nod to, to the VAL in that respect. Fair enough. Um, oh, yeah, this, this one I've seen come up quite a few times in various places. Um, Geotrix has asked, what stopped the Japanese Navy from taking the flight crew and pilot survivors from Coral Sea? and pushing them on Zuikaku for Midway? Yeah, really interesting question. Um, <clears throat> the, the basic answer stems from how the Japanese viewed the air groups on their carriers, that they viewed that air group as actually being an integral part of the carrier itself. And so if the air group is shot to pieces, the carrier is down. Likewise, if, uh, if the carrier is damaged, the air group is, is down. They didn't view the squadrons of that air group uh, in the same sort of cookie-cutter, interchangeable fashion that, uh, that the Americans did. You see at Midway where a number of Saratoga's squadrons end up on Yorktown. The Japanese didn't do that. And so... The answer to the question is there's no physical impediment, really, from having scraped together some sort of a composite air group composed of both Zuikaku and Shokaku aircraft and pilots and putting those all on Zuikaku together and sending her off to battle. I think they could have done that. 
Um, I think I said in Shattered Sword that they probably could have scraped up about 56 aircraft. Bear in mind, of course, that that air group would not have been nearly as effective because it would not have trained together um, or had any chance to, to really work up to the same efficiency that a normal carrier air group would. But uh, another 56 planes at that battle would not have been a bad thing for the Japanese to have at all. Yeah. Um, then we have uh, J. John asks, what evidence exists that Mitcher ordered Ring to fly west versus just covering up Ring's poor decisions? Uh, wouldn't Mitcher have ordered him to turn south after a while? A really interesting question, and what we're alluding to here is the infamous flight to nowhere that you know Hornet's Air Group took off, and I believe, and John Lundstrom also believes, Craig Simons too, basically flew directly to the west on a course of 265, thereby missing Kido Butai uh, to the north, and a lot of those planes ended up going in the drink. There is no... Uh, written smoking gun that points to orders that Mitcher gave to Ring, who is his air group commander, to say, hey, I want you to take your flight off to the west. Um, so the evidence is largely circumstantial. It begins with the knowledge, though, that uh, Nimitz and his intel people very much believed and told their carrier commanders that uh, the Japanese would probably be operating their carriers in two carrier task forces. One that would be closer into the island and would be responsible for bombarding the island, and then a second carrier task force standing off at some distance that would be covering the bombardment task force. So everyone goes into this battle with this mental image that there could be two Japanese carrier task forces out there. Um, so we know that much. The other piece, though, is that when you look at the reports that came out of Hornet, it was required that not only should there be um, a report from the commanding officer, but there should also be subordinate squadron level reports coming up the food chain as well. That didn't happen on Hornet. Uh, there was only one report that came from Hornet, and it was authored by Mitcher himself. And it's pretty clear that uh, Spruance, at least, did not believe a number of the things that were in that report. He explicitly states in his own report that if you've got differences in details between Enterprise and Hornet's reports, you should believe Enterprise's. So it was unusual uh, for the fact that you know, that there were only one report coming up from Hornet in the first place, and, and Spruance clearly had his suspicions. Um, I think that some of that is understandable, and, and we may have talked about this last time, too, and I'm sorry I'm kind of blathering on here, but it's a really interesting topic. Um, you know, if you really look what happened in the Hornet Air Group, we have a, a case of direct insubordination in the air, with John Waldron, you know, basically telling his his air group commander to, to screw off and you don't know where you're going and I do and takes his whole squadron out of the formation and goes off looking for the Japanese himself and ends up getting himself and everybody in his command killed except for, for George Gay. Um, so, you know, now you've got this tricky situation after the battle. You've won this great victory, but... You know, do you really want to open this can of worms around what happened with the Hornet Air Group? Because if you do, you end up, you have to start pointing fingers at, at Waldron and saying, this guy was insubordinate. Um, and yet he's, you know, a martyr and a war hero at the same time. You know, nobody wants to touch that. Uh, so you can kind of see where Mitcher would want to just kind of like, you know, let's just shovel this whole thing under the rug here and, and not talk about it. And to an extent, uh, this is one of the things that Craig Simons points out in, in his new Nimitz biography. To an extent, Nimitz is complicit in that, in that he doesn't want to see the Navy uh, hanging, having to hang out its dirty laundry in public either. And so... 
the the result is that he kind of shelves Mitcher for a while, puts him on, you know, puts him in the doghouse. He's the guy is, you know, promoted up to to admiral's rank, but he commands a patrol plane squadron, not very glamorous. And so Mitcher is kind of in the doghouse for the next fifteen months. Uh, before he finally gets back on Nimitz's good side and gets another carrier command. Anyway, that's a very long, convoluted answer. But uh, <laughs> bottom line is there's not a direct smoking gun that we can point to. It's it's a circumstantial evidence case. Fair enough. Um, so uh, I suppose a quick one. Um, this one, Paul, uh, Paul C.H.R. Thompson, I think that's how it's pronounced, says, um, would the Japanese would Japanese pilots rather ditch than land on another carrier? I think that's a follow up to the sort of the Shikaku's Rikaku element. No, uh, short answer is no. They absolutely would prefer to land on a carrier. Um, and you know, a number of the the refugees from Soryu and Akagi, uh, the combat air patrol fighters who were up in the air when when their carriers got bombed were. Perfectly cheerful to set down on hear you later uh, in the afternoon. Any pilot will tell you that the last thing they want to do is water landing because there's always the chance that you know you come in at the wrong glide slope or something like that, and instead of setting down nicely, you do a pitch and end up upside down, and now you're underwater trying to get your canopy out, and who knows what happens. So, mm. yeah, absolutely yeah. cheerful land on anything floating <laughs> rather yeah. than a drink. Um, and Kaiju Director asks, have either of you seen the older Japanese Midway movies? No, I haven't. Um, it, it's funny because I, I did see the 1976 American Midway movie, mm. and I, so I would have been a, I would have been 14 at the time. And even as a 14 year old, I was like, this is hot trash. This is a terrible movie. But um, I, 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 let me back up. Uh, as far as Japanese movies, I have seen the Midway segment from Eternal Zero, and I thought it was pretty well done. Uh, but I have not seen any theater-length Midway movies, so I guess I'm not as cutting edge on my scholarship as I should be. <laughs> yeah, well, we won't we won't talk about the more recent one. They, <laughs> I don't know. If I shared with you, they hired me as a consultant for that. Okay. Um, um, and. Uh, so you're, yeah. you're, you're probably, okay, I'm, I'm going to slightly steal everybody else's thunder because well, you know, it's my stream, so I can, I can just cut in. Um, uh, I'm going to guess on that basis then, because um, I, I don't have particularly fond feelings about the, 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 the most recent Midway movie, but one of the things that came through, I've, I've actually done a long video review of it that I haven't put up yet. Yeah. And one of the points that came through was I, I, I said... Whoever they got who was in charge of the fine detail knew exactly what they were doing and got everything spot on. And whoever was in charge of like all the macro detail and the CGI and what was actually presented on screen probably deserves to have concrete boots. Um, yeah. I'm going to guess from that, therefore, that you were prob you're probably the, the guy who did, got all the, 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 the little details right. Well, they brought me in very late in the process mm -hmm. and... It was kind of weird because I was like, uh, do you want me to review your script? Because you would think, you know, if you hire the guy, mm -hmm. you know, one of the guys who wrote the book on Midway, you might want him to review your script. No, no, no. That's we, we got that covered. Um, so, yeah, I spent my time tracking down details around uh, what the Admiral's launches looked like and what were the interior paint colors and uh, can you find us shots of the interiors of Japanese warships, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Hmm. So that was not necessarily the most pleasing working relationship, but I don't, I, I don't want to bad mouth anybody either. Uh, having worked on a number of TV shows and hmm. with a number of TV producers, they've always got in mind, you know, what they want the story arc to look like. And so as an historian in those settings, you're often – placed in the role of just damage control mm -hmm. you know how much of this can i mitigate at knowing full well that it ain't going to be perfect because it's either it's a it's a tv show it's a movie you know yeah. what are you going to do um that's just that's just the nature of the beast uh yeah you know one of the first scenes from that movie where you know richard best comes in 
and you know decides sort of on the spur of the moment to do the ridiculous dead stick landing just to kind of you know shake things up for his rear seater and just kind of show that he could you know <laughs> it's just such a phenomenal misreading first of all of what a carrier pilot in general would dare to do and second of richard best's personality uh you know i i missed uh, meeting Dick Best by just a whisker. He was actually going to be on a TV show that I was on, and he was flying out to D.C., had a medical emergency that diverted into Denver. He got off the plane. I never met the guy. But everyone I talked to who did know him said that he was completely by the book, very much a straight arrow, a consummate professional. He never would have come off as this sort of, you know, gum chewing joysy cowboy type. You know, that's just not at all what he was. But, you know, that's but the again the director has to make a character that he thinks is going to be memorable in a movie and ta da, here's what you got. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. I mean as I say, it's I I I will be quite harsh to it at some points when I when I do I ended up doing my re, putting that review up but it was it was I think to be honest it, the thing that annoyed me the most about that movie was the juxtaposition between the stuff they got very right and the stuff that was hilariously wrong it's like like, um, right. like all the bomb placements on the carriers pretty much spot on but at the same time it's right. like they're diving into Battlestar Galactica not a World War Two AA defense. Yeah the flak coming up and, yeah oh my god yeah, yeah. It, we, we could do an entire podcast just on that yeah. it'd make an excellent drinking game too but yeah we, we <laughs> uh, should my, my first viewing went very badly with that I did a, I did a take a shot take a shot every time I spot a major historical inaccuracy uh, my wife stopped me around about the time of Battle of Coral Sea when I was screaming at the screen that Lexington was not a Yorktown class Right, right, yeah, yeah. Don't go there. But there you go. Um, uh, yeah, so moving back to the audience's yeah. questions, they're probably feeling a bit neglected. Uh, Blue Shirt Buddha asks if uh, USS Saratoga hadn't been damaged and made it to Midway in time for the battle, what impact do you think it would have had? Um, I'm not going to steal my own. Th- thunder on that mm-hmm. score because actually some of the this article that I'm working on on Nimitz is not going to address Saratoga directly but does talk about counterfactuals having to do with numbers of carriers on either side. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with, well, how does Saratoga perform during the battle? I mean, if, if she performs like Hornet, then, you know, that's kind of a non-entity. But um, the bottom line is that Given the way the way the cookies crumbled, if the American flight decks had all been operating at a pretty decent efficiency, there's every possibility that they would have knocked out all four Japanese carriers during the first strike. Um, if you look at American doctrine just prior to the war, the math that they ran with was one in six of our dive bombers is going to get a hit. It takes three heavy bomb hits to put a carrier out of action, either sunk or or damaged beyond the ability to to do flight operations. And so that's really the basis for this whole notion of if you've got a full squadron of 18 dive bombers, you devote that to one carrier. If you have uh, two such squadrons, a scouting squadron and a bombing squadron on each of those American carriers, that's a theoretical uh, yield of eight carriers sunk with one attack from four flight decks. So, you know, if Saratoga is along for the for the party, that makes things a lot easier easier for the Americans, that's for sure. Yeah. Um Animal 16365 asks, um, did the Japanese Navy take their experienced naval pilots and use them to train inexperienced naval pilots, as was US practice? Or did they keep their experienced pilot experienced pilots on the front lines, as was German practice? Uh, unfortunately for the Japanese, the answer is the latter. Um, it's funny you look at, at the aftermath of Midway. Uh, about seventy some of the experienced American aviators were immediately shipped home to do pilot training because they had a lot of experience. The Japanese did not do that. They kept their pilots. Uh, in their roles until they were no longer capable of doing it, uh, which usually meant that they were dead. 
And that's one of the contributing factors to the, the market decline in Japanese uh, pilot proficiency that you start seeing towards about the beginning, middle of 1943. A lot of people have this mistaken notion that the Battle of Midway marked the, the death knell for Japan's Naval Aviator Corps. That's not true. Um, actually, one of the questions we had on our last podcast, I, I had to sit down and do a little napkin math, but there were about 486 Japanese aviators, not just pilots, but, you know, backseaters, middle seaters, what have you, aviators at the battle. 110 of those were killed. So, you know, three quarters of them survived the battle. But by the time you get to the end of 1942, Battle of Eastern Solomons, if I remember correctly, the Japanese lost 78 or 79 aviators there. Battle of um, uh, Santa Cruz, they lost 121. And, and of course, there's, you know, onesie twosie casualties happening all, all through this time frame. So really, by the time you get to the end of 1942, and, and we've now fought four carrier battles, the edge has really been taken off of the Japanese pilot corps, and it's, it's only going to get worse from here on out. And a lot of the experienced hands that were still left in the ranks, honestly, were not in that great a shape either. I mean, combat fatigue is, is real, you know? Uh, so... No, they made a, a terrible mistake in not pulling those guys out and using them for training purposes and passing their wisdom along to the to the new cadets that were coming up. Fair enough. Um, and uh, Cody eighty five asks, oh yes, <laughs> another counterfactual thing. Instead of the Yorktowns, so removing Enterprise Hornet and um, uh, Yorktown from the battle, what if Taffy three was at Midway instead? How would that change the battle? It's a bit of an odd what? one. <laughs> That's really interesting. Um, you know, it's it's funny um, when when you look at uh, the battle off Samar and um, the fact that they're under attack by this powerful Japanese um, surface squadron, and and the odds are really pretty hideous, certainly for the destroyers that are screening those vessels, but. The taffies, the two taffies that were under attack, I think between them had something on the order of 400 aircraft, mm. and they do a number on uh, Kurita's battle force. They sink a number of his cruisers, uh, and just by dint of lining up what looked to be credible attack runs, they forced his battleships to maneuver and evade time and time again, thereby throwing off their gunnery solution. So... Um, you know, I wouldn't want to be driving one of those taffies, don't get me wrong, just because, uh, you know, they're, they're pretty slow. Uh, they're certainly not going to be very defensible against a Japanese counterattack. But, you know, if you have enough of those escort carriers and they have enough TBFs on them, lugging torpedoes, you know, they, they can certainly put up a fairly credible defense for themselves. Mm -hmm. That's a very oddball counterfactual. <laughs> I got a, I got a yeah. gold star for that one because that's... <laughs> That was, that was interesting. All right. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, Colin Williams actually asked a question I think we've already um, answered, which was, we know how many planes were lost, but how many pilots did the Japanese lose? I think we just covered that. So um, James I, A. Oh, sorry, go. I was just, you know, brief coda. I can't answer the number of pilots per se, but if, I know a book that actually would give you those answers if you want to run the math. They're all back in the in the appendices in the in okay. sort. Um, yeah, make sure you buy Shattered Sword if you haven't got a copy already. That's right. <laughs> um, uh, then we have James A. asking, what are your thoughts on the book The Silver Waterfall? I have no idea what that is. I have not read it. Fair enough. I have not read it. Apologies for that, then, James, because what's either one of yeah. us hasn't read it or <laughs> the other has no idea what on earth it is. So. And, and, you know, I should just say, too, that... Um, you know, there's a number of the more recent books on Midway that I have not necessarily read. Uh, a guy named Rigby has just come out with a new book on uh, Wade McCluskey uh, in in the battle that I have not read, although my co-author has. Um, so, you know, this is this is one of the problems of of authors just in general. I mean, should I be keeping up? on every single book that's put out by Midway, yeah, in a perfect world, I absolutely would. 
but I've also got this horrible 1942 project that I'm working on that, you know, I have books stacked to the ceiling that I need to read there too. And there's only so many hours in the day. So mm. no, unfortunately I've not, uh, have not read that book. Fair enough. Um, Rocket Guardian asks, uh, so this is sort of following up from a, the previous question we had on Saratoga. Um, what efforts were made to get Saratoga into the battle? As he says, he understands she was repaired and arrived in the area shortly after the battle. Yeah, that's right. Um, she had been up uh, in Bremerton uh, getting repaired from torpedo damage, but then she had to scoot down to San Diego to pick up her air group there and also pick up the admiral who was going to command her task force. And in light of the fact that Nimitz knew that there was a battle coming, he, he sent word to her to expedite uh, she was already on her way down to San Diego at the time, you know, expedite <laughs> picking up the the planes and people that you need and then get out here. And if that means leaving the admiral on the beach, so be it. We'll fly him out to you. Um, so they were certainly making efforts to get her into the picture. But, yeah, she ends up arriving at Pearl Harbor, I believe, on June 6th. So just a couple days late. Yeah, fair enough. Um so ah yes <laughs> so what is going on with shipping with sal merca gliano which is a very long title um so asks can you talk about how the japanese and u.s forces dealt with the issue of logistics for their task forces in particular their respective abilities to refuel and stay at sea for prolonged periods and the strain this exerted on their forces yeah um, interesting question, and one that's often overlooked is the effect of logistics, particularly on early war operations. Um, one of the mistakes that I made in uh, Shattered Sword uh, was not being as aware of true Japanese naval refueling capabilities as I should have been. Um, there's actually a r really interesting article that just recently i.e. within the last couple of years, uh, came out from the U.S. Naval War College, and now I'm spacing the name of the professor who wrote it. But it was as a result of one of his Japanese graduate students who pointed out that actually we were pretty good at, at um, underway refueling and even used the, the more modern side-by-side -side technique. I was not aware of that. That was really cool to, to learn that. So... The bottom line is that the Japanese were were capable of, of pretty good underway refueling operations as evidenced by being able to get all the way over to uh, Oahu uh, for the Pearl Harbor operation. Both navies really suffered, though, from a lack of oilers at the beginning part of the war. There just weren't enough fast oilers that could keep up with a task force uh, capable of, of doing those sorts of operations. And for the U.S. Navy, uh, there's a you know, number of instances where, you know, an oiler couldn't make uh, its rendezvous to pick up the oil that it needed. Or in some cases, you know, an oiler actually being sunk would scupper an entire operation. Uh, you know, the carrier can't get gas. That's the end. You know, you got to go back home. So uh logistics was was a very serious concern uh, in in the beginning part of the war and placed all sorts of constraints on how these carrier task forces could actually operate they were always tethered to some oiler you know 200 miles behind them um they had to keep that in mind at all times hmm. and uh <laughs> alan Eisner, I think, asks, uh, what was Dick Best's altitude when he pulled out of his dive on Carga? <laughs> I think that's unknown. Um, he had a reputation for holding his dives real low. Um, 1,500 feet would probably be a good estimate, which sounds like you know plenty of altitude, but when you just come charging down from... A typical doctrine, they're going to start at about 20,000 feet. They're going to do a gradual descent to pick up airspeed, and then they'll tip over at, you know, uh, 10 or 12,000 feet to do the final uh, vertical piece of the dive. So you've just gone through a, a 10,000 foot long roller coaster in a, in a vertical position, and now you've got to yank the stick back, having just uh, released your bomb. You're pulling a lot of G. And, uh, you know, blacking out is a, is a very real um, risk. 
So holding it down to 2,500 feet, something like that, that, uh, that took a lot of training and uh, some serious airmanship and, and best had both of those things. But yeah, I would estimate about 1,500 mm. feet. Um, Atomic Babel asks, have you ever been invited to NAVC HQ in DC to talk about Midway during the annual Battle of Midway commemoration? I've not been to NAVC. Um, I've been to a number of other Navy uh, installations to do their commemoration uh, day. I mean, June 4th is is the day that the U.S. Navy uh, celebrates Midway throughout all of its commands. So I've done a number of keynotes out at the U.S. Naval War College. I've done uh, a couple of talks at different places in the D.C. area, like the Army Navy Club, uh, but I've not been to NAVC. Fair um, Zhu Fang asks, um, if you were to rewrite Shattered Sword today, or I guess maybe do a revised and updated edition, what changes would you make, if any, in addition to the point on logistics? Yeah. Um, I would say that there there's nothing huge and glaring that I look back now and I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I wrote that. You know, But there are things that we have learned uh, along the way. Um, for instance... Uh, the interactions between the submarine Tambor and uh, Kurita's Cruiser Division 7 that led to the collision between Makuma and Mogami. Uh, Tony and I and our Korean translator, uh, the three of us actually wrote an article on that topic about two years ago, which was really super fun to do, and realized that that the way we had that that all the previous histories had gotten wrong the details of how that collision actually went down so that was kind of fun to do um in retrospect there's this episode that fuchita describes in his book where one of the damaged b-26 bombers at attempts to crash into akagi's bridge I am, in retrospect, very skeptical that it actually happened that way. My sense is that that was actually Jim Murray's, Murray's uh, B-26 that we know buzzed the flight deck uh, during the battle. And my guess is that Fuchida either misremembered or elaborated on that story in some fashion to make it seem like sort of a kamikaze attack when actually, actually Muri made it back home. So there, there's little details like that. Um, I wish the illustrations could have been in color. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing, there's nothing huge and glaring. Actually, okay, one more thing. In the intervening time span, um, it, right after our book got published, Dallas Isom came out with his Midway Inquest, and he talked a little bit in more detail about what was going on in the hangar decks at this time. And he had really good sources. He had actually interviewed some of Here You's surviving um, uh, hangar deck crewmen. One of the things that Tony and I still grapple with now is just what was going on in the hangar decks uh, at the time of the, the 1020 dive bomber attack. I mean, we're, we're still very sure that there was nothing up on the flight decks other than combat air patrol fighters. But the actual status of the hangar decks and which planes were armed and which weren't, that is still just completely... It gets more and more confused the more you look at it. So that's... That's an area in the book that I wish we were, would be able to clarify, but it would be very difficult to do so because it's it's really it's opaque and weird down there. Anyway, yeah, yep. yeah. Um, uh, well, you, you've mentioned your 1942 book, but Rabid Razorback would like to know: Do you have any other new projects underway? I do, in fact, um, and and one which is uh, super fun and. Uh, and also very limited in scope in terms of detracting from, from other things that I'm working on. Um, Trent Hone and Vince O'Hara and a number of other authors and I have all uh, come together to do a new book uh, entitled In the Dark, which is going to be about naval night fighting. Uh, starting from the turn of the 20th century and going up through World War II. So... Um, 
there's going to be a couple chapters on World War One, uh, a chapter on the Russian Navy and the Russo-Japanese War, and then a number of chapters on World War Two. And I'm doing the chapter on the Japanese Navy, and that was really really fun. So I'm that is being put to bed. Um, even as we speak. And I'm also working on a new article on Admiral Nimitz, looking at how he evaluated the odds uh, prior to Midway and how he put together his battle plan. And, and that has been a really interesting project, too, and I think has a number of kind of interesting new interpretations from the source material. I'm hoping to submit that for publication in the next couple months or so. Oh, that sounds really interesting. That night fighting one's <laughs> I'm going to enjoy, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's going to be really good. It's a really good group of authors. I mean, except for me. But. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Paul, S Paul Sater asks, uh, could you speak on the effect of the Japanese post-battle cover-up on later actions? That's a really interesting question. Um I sort of look at the, and for our audience, um, what ended up happening after the Battle of Midway is the survivors from the carriers are sequestered in special hospitals that are blocked off from the public. Um, a lot of the uninjured survivors are quickly shuffled off to commands down in the South Pacific where they can't talk to anybody and where a lot of them will end up dead. Um, and so this is really sort of the beginning of the, the slippery slope as far as Japan is concerned um, of, of just doling out misinformation after misinformation uh, in the aftermath of defeats in their naval battles. And, th and this was an effort that was coordinated at the very top by the emperor uh, who was willing to issue an official rescript in commemoration of the battle, uh, talking about how well it had gone for the Japanese. So I, I think that Midway kind of sets the tone for what the Navy, the, the Imperial Navy, is going to be engaged in now for the rest of the war, that anytime there's a defeat, we are going to cover it up. We're going to say that it was a glorious victory. Uh, and if we do admit to ship losses, we're going to put that in the context of even greater American losses. There's a, a tremendous tendency by the Imperial Navy to overinflate their kill claims. A, a phenomenal um, propensity for doing that. There's a passage out of Admiral Ugaki's diary. He was the chief of staff to Admiral Yamamoto. Um, on December 8th, commemorating, you know, the, the first year of the war. This is December 8th, 1942, sorry. Mm. And he, he presents a litany of the American vessels that they claim to have sunk up to that point in the war. It comes out to 209 <laughs> American warships. Okay, it's just, it's a phenomenally huge list. And... At the same time, you know, they've admitted to their own losses. But the, the bottom line is that if you look at the progress of the Pacific War up to December of 1942, the U.S. and the Japanese were exchanging major warship losses on about a one-to-one -one ratio. But the Japanese believed that they were extracting casualties at a four-to-one ratio from us. That is going to lead to all sorts of really problematic um, issues later on in this war because fast forward now to August of 1945 when the Japanese are debating whether or not they are going to throw in the towel. They believe up to this point in the war that they have bled us absolutely dry, that there is no way – that we haven't inflicted, you know, four or five to one casualties on the Americans. They've got to be close to, to wanting to throw in the towel. And the reality by that point in the war is, no, actually the Americans are inflicting disproportionate casualties on you. But if you don't have the ability to rationally judge the situation, you know, how do you make an intelligent war termination decision either? So, um, yeah, the, the headspace that the Imperial Navy was in, starting at about midway and going downhill from there on out, is it's pretty atrocious. 
Yeah, I, rem I remember, I think it was after the Battle of Santa Cruz and the Japanese were saying they'd sunk something like three or four carriers right. and the American yeah. Admiral just turned around and said, I wish I had as many ships as they thought we'd sunk. Yeah, that was Nimitz. <laughs> You said that exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, wish, um, I wish we had all those carriers. Yeah, as well. I suppose it's the same. I suppose in some ways, maybe maybe it'd be it'd be post-war in the Japanese case. But I'm thinking as well in, from a bit of a UK perspective, the morale effect on the Luftwaffe of uh, Battle of Britain Day when they'd been told the RAF was down to a few dozen fighters and then suddenly right. 400 show up. <laughs> right. And they're yeah. like, oh, well, that's that's a bit inconvenient. <laughs> that's yeah, exactly. Inconvenient um, reality. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that because it's a collection of consonants and no vowels but whoever it is, he asks which of your history professors at Colton was the most influential on your development as a historian? Okay, so that's a great question. I was a geology major. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I was a geo major and I only took two history courses there and one of them was in economic history from a visiting professor whose name I can no longer remember and I ended up writing um, a paper on the uh, ability of the of the Confederacy to wage war against uh, the Northern Union and, and what the disparities were there I honestly look at that paper as being sort of the beginning of hey this is really fun I really like this kind of topic um, and then I took one course from Bill Bonner and on Victorian England, and that is the grand sum of history courses that I took at the college level. Fair enough. Scandalous. I'm, <laughs> I'm self, I'm self-taught. Hey, well, that's, that's always good. <laughs> uh, Cody85 asks, the Brewster Buffalo has gotten a lot of stick over the years. Um, how much did the insistence of the Marines that the Buffalo must have armor and bomb racks hurt their performance? Yeah, and I'll just I'll just state for the record that I do not consider myself um, a real aviation geek. But it's it's funny you should bring that question up because I obviously I'm associated with people who are, and there was a, a voluminous discussion on the characteristics of the the buffalo versus the wildcat, and the fact that when you really look at the performance parameters of the buffalo, it's not that much different from the wildcat. Um, it's hurt by lack of good uh, supercharging at higher altitudes, and its its climb rate was, was poor, uh, which meant that it suffered from a lot of the same problems that the wildcat did at Guadalcanal. It was damned hard to get enough altitude to be able to intercept a zero before you know they came in on you um back to the original question hmm. no question that uh putting more armor and weight on that airframe um was detrimental to its performance the bottom line is though that it was underpowered for what it was and it was not going to be able to put up a good fight against the zero the other question of course always is what were the tactics that were being used by that airframe against the Zero? Because this is, again, very early in the war, and we don't necessarily understand the performance characteristics of the Zero all that well. Um, even late war aircraft like, you know, the, the Hellcat or the, you know, the Corsair, you still didn't want to get into a dogfight against the Zero because it could outturn you. So... Um, the key to being able to fight that airplane was to develop the correct tactics, which were energy-based tactics, you know, boom and zoom. Um, and if, if you try to use the wrong tactics against the Zero, it'll eat your lunch. So my guess is that what you're looking at with, with the slaughter that happens amongst the, the Marine Corps buffaloes is, A, they had an inferior plane and they probably weren't fighting it in the way that it that they could most optimally have done so against the zero mm -hmm. um michael o'brien or o'brien possibly asks if um if all the u.s gets another counterfactual and if all the u.s carriers at the battle of midway were replaced by uss midway circa 45 46 how does the battle go 
Okay, I think we've officially we've officially reached the point of you know what if mm. um, Wellington had had a B fifty two at the at the <laughs> Battle of Waterloo? I mean, I, come on, of course it'd be a walkover. You know, let's give the Americans jets too. Um, yeah, I, I I I don't think we need to go there. Fair enough. Um, uh, Rita Loy asks. What effect did the Mark VI Exploder, and I guess the general defects in U.S. torpedoes at the time, have on the battle? So one of the questions that we got on uh, the previous podcast was, okay, the American torpedo planes came in and tried to do their thing against uh, the Japanese carrier force. First Torpedo Squadron 8, VT-8, then VT-6, and finally VT-3. Um and all of those attacks were unsuccessful. What's going on there was was the main question. Um, the sense I get very much is that most of those planes, almost all of those planes, were never in a position to drop a weapon in the first place because they got shot down. Uh, that's certainly the case with uh, VT-8, where the only guy that I'm aware of who actually dropped a torpedo was Ensign Gay. Um, now that that fish is in the water, um, the problem for a lot of those drops, if they even were made, was that the drop angles were lousy. The, the Japanese, what they would do when they saw one of these squadrons coming in is they would turn tail and run because against a 100-knot airplane, uh, if you're a 30-knot carrier, you've now chopped you know, 30% of the, the speed of advance of, of this airplane away from it which gives your zeros just that much more time to chew it to pieces. And even if they do get a drop on you, it's probably going to be from a stern or or some sort of a crummy uh, crummy angle. And the U.S. fish weren't that fast. So, I mean, Soryu and Hiryu could just flat out outrun our torpedoes. You needed to be doing a hammer and anvil attack from ahead of those targets to give yourself a good chance to actually... Uh, land a hit. And then the final piece would be, well, given the design defects on that torpedo, even if you had gotten a physical hit against the target, would the exploder have worked? And that's what our questioner is alluding to. The answer probably is no. And from what we know about the Japanese source material, you don't find a lot of them saying, oh my God, we just, you know, barely missed you know, getting hit by that particular torpedo with, you know, a radical maneuver or whatever, they're not commenting on that. So that says that the the majority of the problem really is the fact that your planes are being shot down before they could actually launch. And the the exploder, whether or not it worked or not, was really sort of immaterial. Hmm. Um Green Goblin Z asks, from what I understand, the Japanese surface forces had a pretty pretty big emphasis on night fighting. Was this the same case for their carrier air wings? No. Um, Now, could the Japanese perform night operations if they needed to? Yes. Um, They had uh, landing light apparatus, uh, which would allow them some limited ability to recover uh, strikes after dark, although, to be honest, they would probably end up turning on their deck illumination and, and maybe searchlights as well to bring their their birds home um but it was not part of standard operating procedure that hey yeah let's go fly off a a major strike in the middle of the night and go find the enemy that way now that said uh they did have some specialized uh scout planes that they used at night i'm trying to remember the exact designator i think it's the e11a there were only like 13 of these things made um it was a special uh, night scout plane that was carried by some of their 5,500 ton light cruisers, uh, specifically to go out and find enemy forces at night so that they could bring the surface forces in on them. Um, but that's really the only instance I'm aware of where they intentionally would do flight ops at night and it wasn't off their carriers. Mm-hmm. Um, De- Detlef Croese. Croze? I don't know. Um, asks, how much cross pollination is there between Japanese and American midway dash naval historians? Not as much as I wish, to be honest. Um, 
the number of Japanese historians who speak good English is is greater than the number of American historians who speak good Japanese. Um, but you know, I'm I'm friends with, and I say that with some hesitancy. I, I am friendly with uh, Tomatsu Haruo, who's one of their finest naval historians. But it's not like we're bosom buddies and we're trading emails all the time. Um, there's another gentleman uh, named Yoji Koda, who actually used to be the commander in chief of their maritime self-defense force, who actually lives over here. He lives near Boston. Great guy, super fluent in English and, and a real scholar on a number of, of, uh, the battles, but he doesn't, he doesn't publish. I mean, so there's a little bit of interchange, but there really still is this this language barrier that is keeping us from being able to interact as well as we would like. I still maintain hope that um, translation software just keeps getting better and better all the time, and that that's going to start lowering those barriers. But right now, you know, those two individuals are the only two people on that side of the pond that I really know um, and could ask questions to. Fair enough. Um, Rocket Guardian asks, which of the Japanese admirals bears the most responsibility for the defeat at Midway between Yamamoto and Nagumo? And and this also ties into one of the questions we got on on last the last podcast. You know, how do I view Nagumo? Um, I think the lion's share of the blame has to go to Yamamoto just for the battle plan that he put together. That said, I think that Yamamoto was a product of his military culture and that if you'd put a guy like, you know, Toyota or Koga or one of those dudes in command of, of coming up with a battle plan that he probably would have come up with just as convoluted a mess as Yamamoto did. Um, so now if we go down to the task force level and we look at Nagumo, I really look at Chuichi Nagumo as a tragic figure that this is a guy that did not have a great deal of insight into the weapons platform that he commanded and therefore had to lean on his staff officers very heavily to help him out in that regard. I think that broadly speaking, Nagumo fought the Battle of Midway correctly as far as his doctrine would let him do so. But that you, you got to remember that at this point in the war, you know, this is the second carrier battle that's ever been fought. And the, the playbook, if you will, on both sides is, is pretty darn thin. So there weren't a lot of historical examples to use as analogs. And you know, the, the bottom line is for Nagumo that he ends up not sending out uh, an attack with his dive bombers alone when he might have done so. Uh, instead, opts for uh, the whole enchilada. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna wait for my dive bombers, my torpedo planes, and you know, I want to give the, the the full meal deal uh, to the Americans. That is the doctrinally correct solution in his playbook. Unfortunately, he is behind the eight ball in terms of time by then, and he's not given the the time that he needs to actually put that full strike together. Fair so Robert Dennett asks, given your work on your upcoming book, I'm curious if you feel the UK could have aided the Pacific War effort before they sent USS Robin, a.k.a. HMAS Victorious. Wow. <laughs> I think if you look at just the number of irons that the Royal Navy has in the fire... Uh, in the beginning of 1942, I I can't see that you would want to give the Pacific um, priority sufficiently enough to get enough warships out there to do anything against the Japanese. And the bo the bottom line is, um, having victorious out there that's great. But you know, Kitabutai is either four or six carriers, and until you can get a critical mass of carriers of your own, you're not you're you're not in a position to really do all that much. And given the perilous situation in the Mediterranean at this time, 
Uh, I honestly, if I had been calling the shots, I would have preferred to see <laughs> all of the the carriers and 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 war spite as well. Um, helping to prop the the situation up in the med i i see that as more dire for the for the british than the situation in the pacific I, I, just because you know half measures of the pacific aren't going to do you any good so that's that's kind of where i come down on it yeah um i've i've actually recently was read a copy of a message that was sent in late 42 because the us did ask for some British carrier assistance shortly after the Battle of Midway. Yes. And although this reply, that was refused, I haven't have found the full text of the refusal in the archives for that, but in, I think it's November 42, they, they're ba the British are basically turning around and saying, well, look, we, we only actually have five fleet carriers operational, mm. which, I mean, to the US probably sounded a little bit a little bit trollish, <laughs> saying we have five carrier decks, but they pointed right. out furious doesn't have the range to operate with the U.S. carriers in the right. Pacific. Um, yep. The Indomitable's just been blown pe almost to pieces by the Luftwaffe and is in the middle of repairs. Formidable yep. needs um, its engines seeing to after Operation Torch winds up, and that leaves Illustrious and Victorious, at which point you're actually... Um, you've only got two decks, and they're kind of, well, we kind of need those for the whole, you know, fighting Germany and Italy thing. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Particularly if you're still paranoid about um, about turpits potentially breaking out in the North Atlantic or what have you, so mm -hmm. yeah, I you know we could start talking about the Atlantic and let's not let's yeah. <laughs> stick yeah. a bit to midway, but yeah, I, I just don't think that the British were really in a position to intervene in any sort of a I, I don't want to use the word credible in a mm -hmm. pejorative fashion, but again. Britain was stretched incredibly thin at this point in the war, and you got to make some some hard decisions about where you're going to focus. And I really think that, you know, the Med is is the place where you kind of had to. Yeah. Um, Frank Spazato asks, how good was U.S. Navy anti-aircraft gun uh, firepower at Midway, um, and were many other ships damaged beyond you know, Yorktown, Neosho, and Sims being sunk? Right. Well, and Neosho and, and Sims, of course, were, were sunk at Coral Sea. Oh, yeah, um, <laughs> no problem. Um, the U.S. It's funny. I have a, a set of graphics on this. The U.S. was just at the beginning of its transformation in terms of anti-aircraft firepower. At this point in time, the majority of the anti-aircraft that is on the escorting vessels is pretty primitive. I mean, you got even you got a fair number of 50 caliber machine guns, which is not all that effective a weapon. They're starting to put more 20 millimeter uh, Orlikens on. There's not a lot of Bofors at all at this point. There's still a lot of 1.1 inch uh, stuff on the carriers. And indeed, even uh, I believe when North Carolina, uh, which is one of the more modern uh, fast battleships, was first deployed, she too had 1.1 inch uh, on some of her her stations. That is going to radically transform uh, even in the next four months or so. By the time you fast forward to Battle of Santa Cruz, there's a lot more Bofors now uh, aboard these ships, a lot more radar too, a lot more Orlikans. Um, suddenly the, the throw weight of uh, a U.S. carrier task force, I believe it's almost doubled uh, within that time frame, so, but but the but the rock of this whole system, as you pointed out in one of your previous videos, is is the heavy caliber uh, anti aircraft gun systems, and in that respect, the U S. is on incredibly good ground because we've got the five inch thirty eight. Even the five inch twenty five is not a bad anti aircraft weapon, and that was on a number. of the carriers and cruisers, five inch thirty eight, you know, hands down the best heavy anti aircraft gun of the war, I think, and so that's a very solid foundation to build on. And what needed to augment that again was lighter and medium caliber automatic weapons. There's not a lot of those at the Battle of Midway, but fast forward four months and there's going to be a ton more. Yeah, I, I did love reading some of the um, post Eastern Solomon's and post Santa Cruz. Um, 
reports from Enterprise, I think after Eastern Solomons, is basically saying, the 20mm Orlican is great, can we have more? And then after yeah. Santa Cruz, like, well, more was good, but now have, I'm, I want to ask, can we remove the ship's belt armour to save weight to add even more 20mm? Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's no amount of ac that that is too much. Yeah. It's funny, too, because... Um, after the Battle of Santa Cruz, um, when a number of the pilots from Junio came back after their strike against the Hornet, and they had to fly through the gauntlet to get at her, some of those pilots came out of the out of the cockpit almost incoherent because they could not adequately describe what it was that they had just flown through, and you know you think about that, and this is. You know, Santa Cruz is really sort of only at the beginning of the the true transformation. You know, fast forward now to the middle of 1944, and the amount of anti aircraft firepower now being powered by VT fused ammunition for the five inch guns. Uh, it's just it's mind boggling. How how could you even fly into anywhere near one of these carrier formations? It's it's tantamount to signing your own death warrant. Which is the reason that the Japanese moved to special attack. They, they're they able to do the math after the Battle of Philippine Sea. It's like, why are you going to train a naval aviator for a year, year and a half, only to throw that guy's life away after one or two sorties? It just doesn't make any sense. We've got to find out another way to attack the Americans, and we can't do it with conventional tactics. It just will not work. Mm. So. Um, Sean Mack asks, was it Spruance's decision that Enterprise and Hornet would launch full strikes rather than smaller, easier to launch packet strikes? That's a really good question. Um, and let me think about this because, again, our book was mostly looking at the Japanese side of the battle. Mm. And I don't, I'm not going to venture an answer to that question because I think I'll muff it. Uh, I don't think it would have been Spruance's decision. It probably would have ended up on the shoulders of Browning uh, to to make that call because you got to understand at this point in the game, Spruance is still very much learning on the job. He is not a carrier admiral. He's keenly aware of the fact that he's not a carrier admiral. So he's soaking up as much as he can, as quickly as he can. But I, I think you, the, it's the next day that you see the real watershed event um, when the Americans are going to launch a, a follow-up strike and uh, Browning wants to launch it from too far away and, and Earl Gallagher and, and McCluskey too, I believe, uh, come charging up to the bridge to say, you know, thousand pound bomb, you know, self-sealing fuel tanks, this whole thing, we're too far away, you can't launch this strike. They get up in Browning's grill, who is the chief of staff, and there and a, a pretty vociferous argument happens on the bridge, and Spruance finally intercedes directly on the part of the aviators. He says, "I'll do what you aviators want," and Browning completely uh, leaves the bridge in a huff and goes off to his cabin to sulk. So. I do not think that Spruance would have made that call on the day of the actual battle. He would, he would have relied on Browning to make that call. Fair enough. Uh, Carl von Gassenberg asks, how much um, were U.S. kills overinflated in the aerial part of the combat? I can't give you a hard answer to that. I do know that there, there definitely was overinflation, certainly on the part of the B-17s who claimed that they had sunk two of the Japanese carriers, and that claim stood for years. Um, so, yes, there certainly was uh, over overclaiming on the part of the Americans, although it was also recognized on the part of their commanders <laughs> that you have to take all aviator reports with a serious grain of salt um, and, you know, in many cases, the, the sort of rule of thumb was, yeah, let's cut that down by a factor of three and we should be in the ballpark. But yeah, there you go. Hmm. Um, Rocket Guardian asks, do you think Fletcher should have been given a bigger role in the latter half of the war? Um, could he have been a good task force or fleet commander? I absolutely do. Um, I think that he had demonstrated that he understood how to... Uh, to run a carrier task force. Um, 
and it's a shame that he was not. I will say that I think if you sort of fast forward to the composition of the task force commanders at Philippine Sea, for instance, Fletcher would have been a pretty odd duck there because he was not as uh, just hyperbolically aggressive as uh, a guy like Jocko Clark, who just, you know, was <laughs> absolutely <laughs> aggressive. It, it's funny. I, I sort of look at late war American task force commanders as being kind of the nautical equivalent of, of German Panzer uh, division leaders. I mean, they're both products of a very technocratic upbringing and, uh, and, and also very, very aggressive just by nature. So you look at what happens at, at the Battle of Philippine Sea where, you know, Jocko Clark wants to go charging off to the west and go after the, you know, the Japanese carriers hell-bent for leather. And Spruance won't let him. Um, you know, I have this sort of mental image of Spruance holding on to the leashes <laughs> of the pack of slavering attack dogs who were just like, oh, you know, come on. Um, Fletcher was very much not that kind of cat. He was very much a, a very judicious commander um but he understood that at the point of the war that he was fighting in that he had to be judicious with his forces because you know yes we have this enormous naval building program underway but those carriers are not yet in the water jocko clark had the luxury of knowing that even if i lose a carrier i've still got 15 more Essex classes behind them you know mm -hmm. that, that didn't have that in 42 yeah um jade of arc asks um in Emmerich's Midway movie, that's the latest one, um, there was a scene where before the attack, the Japanese Navy have a war game where some junior officers playing the US carriers school Nagumo with a carrier force that's positioned closer to Midway than per to Pearl Harbor. Did that actually happen? The particulars of the war game that they fought uh, before the battle are not as well known as I wish they were. Uh, to be honest with you, we do have a number of instances where Ugaki, again, the chief of staff of Combined Fleet, who was playing the referee, would sort of overrule uh, some of the positions of the junior officers in terms of tactics. And that was that was very much resented um, by those junior officers. So I, I, I think you can make an argument that the Japanese did not learn as much from those war games as they perhaps should have. Although here is an area where I made a mistake in the book that I wish I could rewrite now. There's a, this infamous scene where during one of the phases in that war game, Kaga gets sunk. And uh, later on in the exercises, Kaga is resurrected and participates in a follow-on phase of the operation. And starting with Gordon Prang's book, um, Miracle at Midway, which was actually ghostwritten by Donald Goldstein. But anyway, you know, this was this was portrayed as, you know, that's cheating. You resurrected Kaga from her watery grave. And, you know, how dare you do that? Alan Zim, who is an actual naval operations planner, pointed out to me that I didn't understand how naval war games actually worked in that respect, that it's perfectly legit to have a multi-phased war game, you know, exploring this facet of the operation, that facet, the other facet, and to say, okay, well, why did Kaga get sunk in this portion of the war game? Okay, good. Let's develop a contingency plan to alleviate that problem okay let's assume that we're going to use that contingency plan it's therefore okay to assume that kaga would be with us for portion two of the war game so that that is something that i actually would rewrite if i could mm -hmm. um Deotrix asks would if halsey had been in command uh, would he have lost a carrier or two on day two um, if he was in charge instead of Spruance, considering that Halsey may not have pulled back during the night but tried to keep on going. Again, uh, the crystal ball is not as... Uh, is, who knows? Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I certainly think the risk is greater that that might have happened, that the American carrier forces would have continued moving west during the night and would have blundered into a Japanese surface force that was very definitely out looking for them at that time. Um, 
Um, Jerry Hammond asks, were American torpedoes fueled with eth ethyl alcohol? <laughs> um, no, they were... Well, which American torpedoes? Mm -hmm. That's the next question. You know, are we talking Mark 13, Mark 14 airdrop? What are we talking? Um, the majority of submarine and uh, surface launch torpedoes were, were using kerosene uh, as, as the fuel and then uh, burning um, uh, air as, as the oxidant. I don't know about the air, the air dropped ones. Yeah, I know some of them did because that's where the torpedo juice comes from. But ah. yeah, what 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 limitation? What li which torpedoes and and when in the in the uh, war? I'll, I'll find out. Jerry, some point. Yeah. You know yeah. um, John Ski asks, "What if the Japanese had known that their naval codes had been compromised? Would they then have actually launched the attack on Midway?" Uh, again, unknowable. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they certainly would have ended up, you know, they, they actually were at the process of shifting over their codes and, uh, and changing them out. And in fact, it's, it's just a couple days before Midway that suddenly uh, Hypo is no longer able to translate their messages for a number of months. Uh, I think if they had known that their codes had been compromised, they certainly would have changed their operational plan uh, dramatically as a result of that and maybe not have gone there at all. Hmm. Um, Jerome Lufkins asks, "Why were Midway? Why were the Midway-based bombers, including dive and torpedo bombers, so much less effective than the carrier-based bombers?" Well, in some cases, they were flying, um, you know, aircraft that were actually a generation behind the SBD uh, Dauntless. Here, you're flying the Vindicator, which is not as good a plane. Um, training had a lot to do with it. Uh, a lot of these squadrons were very green, even even by the standards of the day. Uh, had not trained a lot. You look at uh, VT8's detachment of TBF Avengers that had just showed up uh, to the battle and, and and flew off of the island rather than off of the Hornet. TBF is a is a great plane. This is its first combat debut. Um, the guys in that plane, you know, have had bare time to exercise together. So that's a problem. And they don't have any sort of fighter escort coming along with them either. Uh, that particular attack, which happens at about seven in the morning, it's a composite attack between the six TBFs that are coming out from Midway, the four army B-26s, which, you know, right there, there's a problem. You know, you got two different services flying aircraft of different airspeeds. They just kind of showed up at the same time, roughly speaking. Those Army medium bombers, they're not designed to drop torpedoes. You know, they managed to strap a torpedo to the belly of those things, but tell me that those crews had any idea of actually what they were trying to do with that weapon. It's laughable. So, you know, it's the bottom line is it's early in the war, a lot of green crews, never been in combat before, and we don't know how to do joint operations. We don't know how to coordinate Navy and Army assets into any sort of a cohesive strike package. It's just there's a lot of factors that are working against those people. Mm. Um, what's we got here? here we go. Uh, so. Uh, again, another one I'm not going to try and pronounce. says, uh, why did Hiryu head northeast after the bombing of the rest of the Kido Butai carriers to close with the enemy? Was it to provide combat air patrol for uh, battleships and cruisers? Was wind direction or doctrine basically why are they going that way? Yeah, so just as background to for our, our viewers, yeah, after the first three Japanese carriers are knocked out, Admiral Nagumo shifts his flag over to a light cruiser and gathers up what surface forces he can and is trying to physically close the gap to the American uh, carrier task forces to launch a surface attack them, against them. That's the only way that he can figure out to turn this game around. Here you is apparently providing some distant air cover for that task force, but ends up kind of trailing along in its wake and closing the range to the Americans as well, which we absolutely excoriate uh, Admiral Yamaguchi 
uh, the commander of Carrier Division 2 for having done that. There was no reason to have done that, um, or no rational reason for having done that. Um, I, As we argue in the book, I, I really feel like what's going on there is that Yamaguchi's uh, frame of reference is being narrowed down to where he's not able to put his actions into the larger context of this war and instead becomes hyper-focused on immediate tactical concerns and, and frankly, concerns, I think, of personal honor that I can't run away. Uh, i got to back up Nagumo on this thing. And so if he's heading that way, I'm heading that way too. When the reality is you're fighting, you, you have to know if you're Yamaguchi, you have to know that if you've just lost three carriers in the course of seven minutes, there have to be two enemy flight decks out there, at least. And your own air power has already been whittled down. Does it make sense for here you to counterattack? Absolutely. Get your licks in, but do it from a distance because there's going to come a point when your own air power is going to, you know, have gone down the the spiral into, into nothingness. And at that point, I want to be right at the exit so that I can say cheerio and, you know, get out the back way because I can't lose this carrier. It's precious. It's, it's six years worth of shipbuilding for God's sake or something on that order. I mean, the, losing these carriers is tantamount to a national catastrophe. We can't lose here. You, um, but he does not play the game that way. And sure enough, she, she ends up buying it. Mm. Um, uh, Twinkie Octopus asks do you have a favorite fact that maybe most people don't know about Midway <laughs> wow other than the recipe to the sink pack no <laughs> <laughs> no I, I don't know that I do have a favorite fact I mean obviously one of the ones that I harp on constantly is the fact that the Americans actually weren't all that outnumbered by the Japanese during the battle I will say that I have a favorite episode, and that really is Dick Best's attack on Akagi, um, where he is able to recognize very quickly that uh, his own attack on Kaga has been spoiled. But you know, as a result of the double heap and helping of of firepower that's being dropped on top of Kaga, that this other carrier over here is likely to get away scot free. And we need to stop that right now. Um, his ability to improvise in space and come over with two wingmen and do that carrier in personally. And, you know, he's got the airmanship not only to – he's got the, the brains to figure out what the, the situation is and the airmanship to actually put the ordnance on the target and sink that target I, that's that's a hair raising point in the battle because it is absolutely essential that that Akagi be put out of action at that point in the battle. Yeah, Robert Dennett is asking, what did Admiral Leahy actually do during World War Two? Wow, um, <laughs> <laughs> he <laughs> he was actually uh, an extremely uh, valuable aid to FDR. That's that's really what it comes down to. That that and and Lay's ability to kind of ride herd uh, over the the Joint Chiefs also was was valuable too. But he he really plays more of a and not an administrative role, but but kind of a he, I don't want to use the the term badly, but he's a sidekick to to FDR. He's a man much like Marshall that FDR trusts implicitly to give him good unalloyed uh, information, uh, and and that I think is is his valuable uh, his value to to the war effort. Um. Frank Spazato asks, how does the Japanese Kantai Kesson doctrine change after Midway? Um, was the sinking of Yorktown a product of it originally? Kantai Kesson, which is decisive sea battle, uh, really f sort of forecast uh, a climactic clash of 
the battleship forces between the Japanese Navy and the U.S. Navy. And that was the, the basis for all of the Japanese naval doctrine throughout the entire interwar period. I don't really see that concept going by the wayside at all, to be honest with you. I, I think if you if you then fast forward to the Guadalcanal campaign, one of the things that's going on there is that it takes the Japanese an inordinately long time to get their heads around the fact that Guadalcanal actually is the decisive campaign of, of this portion of the war. But it doesn't look anything like, you know, what pre-war Japanese doctrine taught them it should look like. It was not a clash of surface fleets out in the middle of the ocean. You know, you're fighting over this malarial hellhole down in the middle of nowhere. How does that factor in? And as a result of that, I think that the Japanese were hesitant to commit their heavy surface forces, particularly Yamato, Nagato, and Mutsu, their three biggest battleships, um, Musashi a little later on, but she didn't come out until after the campaign was decided. You know, uh, Mutsu and Yamato were in truck for the majority of the Guadalcanal campaign and never really left the anchorage. The Japanese weren't willing to commit those units because that didn't look like the decisive battle to them, plus there were fuel considerations. Um, and then you fast forward all the way to the Battle of Leyte Gulf. That's really kind of Kantai Kessen all over again. Now it's you know by matter of necessity because our heavy surface units are the only things we've got left to us. Our carriers have been sunk. So I think that that, that, that sort of tendency towards wanting to foment a climactic and decisive sea battle you know that theme carries throughout the entire war i don't think midway puts an end to it at all mm -hmm. yeah um yeah i must admit one of the questions i've i answered in i can't remember whether i answered recently in a dry dock or in a dry dock i've been recording for the future was basically what what would have been the best japanese battleships to send in to guadalcanal to try and help them out and um, I think well, the, the hindsight answer is Mutsu, considering that she would have blown up. We know we know she would have blown up shortly thereafter, anyway. So you might as well get yeah. some use out of her. But yeah, it's, right. I, I I think I came to the conclusion the Nagatos were probably the best balance because the Fusos and Isais are too slow to get in and out, and yeah. Yamato yeah, is that's... just too much of a big strategic asset to risk. Right. Yeah, and to, you know, we're, I know that we're badly <laughs> deviating, it, but uh, no, you look at the the four oldest battleships in the inventory: Ise, Hyuga, uh, Fuso, and Yamashiro. They never left home waters. They never even get to truck, you know, because they were not looked at as being first line units. The thing that really baffles me is their hesitancy to commit all four. Of battleship division three, uh, their fast battleships, uh, the Congo class, in the the two battles in the middle of November of 1942. Um, you know, the first, the, the battle of the Friday the 13th, they come down uh, with um, with Hiei and, and Kirishima as the bombardment unit, but at Congo and Haruna, their two sisters were loitering north at Antong Java Atoll and could have come with Admiral Abe that first night. Okay, maybe you make this decision that you don't want to send four battleships to the constricted waters of Iron Bottom Sound, but by God, having lost Hiei on that occasion, and now you're coming back down uh, as Admiral Kondo, you know, to put this thing to bed, but you only bring uh, Kirishima with you. Mm. Why did you not bring Congo and Haruna? I don't know the answer to that question, but that to me again implies that they just were not willing to fight down to the last mm. bloody rowboat in the way that Halsey was uh, to secure sea control around Guadalcanal. It's baffling. Yeah. Um, Scooter JSP asks if the Japanese had grouped more of their surface units with the carriers instead of the transports, could the additional anti-aircraft fire, despite its somewhat questionable quality, have made a difference countering the U.S. attack? 
really interesting question. Um, yeah, was there a more optimal uh, task force composition that might have made a difference in that battle? If, if you're a carrier commander, the last thing in the world you want is to be tagging along with a bunch of slower battleships. And so I think you can rule out you know, any of the, the heavy units of the main body. It does not make any sense to bring along a 22, 23-knot unit like Mutsu or Nagato um, along with the fast carrier task force. That said, um, I think that the four cruisers of Kurita's Crew Div 7 uh, the Mogami class heavy cruisers would have been a very valuable addition to Nagumo's task force. They would have given him more anti-aircraft uh, firepower, and they would have beefed up his um, float plane coefficient, allowing him to uh, put up a denser search pattern that morning with his with his scouting aircraft from his cruisers. Uh, both of which I think would have been valuable additions to to his task force. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so we, we're just coming up on half past eight. So I know this is about yeah. about the total amount of time you you wanted to I'm dedicate right. to it. No, I'm 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 flexy. You know, I, I'm, I'm if you're good, I'm good. Yeah. Well, I, I'm the thing that you, that's a dangerous thought because I'm notorious for doing four to six hour streams, but I don't think many people are going to. I'm not doing that. But no. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm good. Well, we'll try. We'll try and rattle through a few more of the of, of these then, because I've I've been saving some that um, I'm pretty confident I can answer independently for later. Um, okay. So we'll stick with these ones. Um, Ms. April asks, um, Aussie folklore has something called Frumel being the first to discover Op Order fourteen and an incomplete intercept on the twentieth of May, and then notifying Hypo and Op twenty G. Have records of the intercept ever turned up and would the data have been valuable to your research um that is really interesting to me okay and i'm just gonna throw this right out here i am not uh, a crypto scholar and in fact that was one of the areas in the book that we deliberately stayed away from because we didn't think that we had anything credible uh to add um to that particular narrative and, and more broadly speaking to the american narrative we felt that that had been covered pretty well by other authors. Having said that, I think that it's important to acknowledge uh, the activities of America's allies in terms of intelligence gathering and that they absolutely were plugged into the same sort of network and were actively sharing information back and forth with each other. So I don't know if it's true uh, that the first decrypt of that order um, came from Australia. It's it's possible, I suppose, um, but yeah, that, it would be interesting if that's true. I I can't speak to it at all, though. Fair enough. Um, Richard Orter asks, excluding Pearl Harbor, how did Japanese spies have an impact on the Pacific Naval War? Um, was there one who could have changed midway for the Japanese? No, no. I don't think so. Fair um, yeah. Once, once their their man in Pearl Harbor was was basically out of business, um, there are no further recorded instances that I am aware of that they were being fed any credible human intel on our side of the pond. Mm-hmm. And the same is true, obviously, on their side of the pond. You know, um, there weren't a lot of Americans that were walking around in Japan, and there certainly weren't uh, a lot of Japanese who were feeding inf- information to us as well. It was a very locked down war in that respect, as opposed to what you see happening in Europe. Yeah. Uh, Pacific was a completely different animal. Well, I suppose it is a little bit easier for a British person to pretend to be German or vice versa than it is for a Japanese person to pretend to be American and vice versa. Precisely. Yeah. Um, Rocket Guardian asks, you seem to prefer thoughtful and considered admirals over highly aggressive ones. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> That's a... Uh, uh, in general, yes, but, but let me, you know, fast forward then to the end of 1942 and looking at the Guadalcanal campaign and, and give uh, Halsey his due. Um he was absolutely the right guy uh, in the, the right place at the right time for that campaign. Uh, ferociously aggressive. 
but the thing that I think made him uh, such an effective commander of the Southwest Pacific Theater was also, well, aggressiveness coupled with the ability to operate jointly. Uh, one of the things that I admire so much about Halsey is that when he comes in to take over command, one of the problems they've got is that the harbor in New Caledonia is just chock-a-block with unloaded uh, cargo vessels because they can't get enough dock space and the French won't let them build warehouses and, you know, there's just, there's problems there. Well, he solves the, the, the French problem by just basically marching ashore with a Marine contingent and saying, okay, I, the Japanese consulate is now my headquarters and we're, you know, building a bunch of new warehouses and you don't have any say in the matter. Sorry. <laughs> um, so that's one problem. But the other, then to actually untie this whole snafu of what's going on in the harbor, he taps an army general, a logistics expert on the shoulder and says, I got to have you solve this problem for us. You know, we got to get this cleaned up so that we can get those ship bottoms back in circulation and getting more supplies out here rather than just parking them in the harbor and using them as warehouses. That's just not going to get it done. And this speaks to a larger issue. Shipping in 1942, and really for the remainder of the war, shipping is the lifeblood of everything that the Western Allies are going to do in this war. Shipping is is everything. So having a bunch of ships, you know, cargo ships sitting around in Noumea and not getting unloaded is is a hair on fire emergency. We've got to get those vessels back in operation. So the ability for, for Halsey to work smoothly with his army counterparts, and he, famously he was able to get along with MacArthur as well, um, <laughs> you know, which wasn't easy to do. Um, that's something I really admire about Halsey. And the other thing is, um, you know, speaking to his aggressiveness, again, if we look at those um, – naval battles in the middle of November 1942, particularly the second naval battle of, of Guadalcanal. I've just slagged on Kondo for not bringing down his three fast battleships when he could have. Think about the situation on the other side of the coin that Halsey is facing. Enterprise is damaged. Uh, the squadron that was in Iron Bottom Sound uh, and fought the battle of uh, Friday the 13th has just been blown to pieces and they've all had to retreat because even the ships that, you know, made it through that battle, almost all of them are damaged and not combat worthy. I know that that Kondo is coming down to do a repeat bombardment of Henderson Field. The only thing I have available to me is the battleships Washington and South Dakota and four destroyers. I'm sending them into Iron Bottom Sound, which is about the size of a bathtub. You know, I, these battleships can lob a shell from one side of that thing to the other. Um, the danger of Japanese torpedo attacks are frightening. I, essentially, what we're doing here is we're condemning Admiral Willis Lee, who's going to be the surface force commander, to the nautical equivalent of a cage match. Okay, <laughs> Here you go. You got to hold on, and if things go pear shaped, you can't get out. There's only three exits from that thing. You know, good luck. But that gives you an indication of uh, the difference in mentality that Halsey had uh, as opposed to Kondo and particularly Yamamoto. I am determined to hang on to this airfield, I am going to fight down to the last bloody rowboat if need be, to keep this thing. And this is literally my last nickel, and I'm pushing it in. Hmm. Let's go. Are your battleships better than mine? We're going to find out. <laughs> and, you know, so uh, I, I do have uh, respect for aggressive admirals. They, they just <laughs> they need to be put in the proper situation. That's, that's the larger answer yeah. to that question. Yeah, fair enough. Um, Cody85 asks, if you were the Japanese high command, what changes would have you, you have made to the Midway plans? If you're serious about taking Midway and we're at a point in the war where we have um, pretty much unchallenged 
superiority in terms of naval aviation. There's no reason to to pussyfoot around this thing, man. Just take your sledgehammer and go in and, you know, take this place. Take all your carriers, you know. <laughs> There's no need for deception. Just go in there and and you know, put your put your task force together where you've got six carriers. Put put the push the operation off by three weeks until you can patch up Zui Kaku at least, integrate uh, Zui Ho and maybe Ryu Zhou into this task force. Bring eight carriers to the party and put this thing to bed. You know, why are you messing around with this incredibly complex, distorted battle plan? that is relying on deception to try to lure the Americans out to their defeat, you know, mm-hmm. it just, it doesn't make any sense. If you've got a sledgehammer, use it because you're not going to have it forever. Um, you know that the Americans are building a ton of carriers in the background. You've got the initiative now and the bigger hammer, use that hammer. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, James Thompson asks, um, Admiral Halsey was relieved of command before the Battle of Midway. When did he get command back? Wow. Hmm. I don't know the answer to that question. And and relieved of command um, makes it sound... He, he, he had to take a, a medical leave of absence hmm. is really the, the way to portray that. Hmm. Um, and now I'm trying to think about what ends up happening right after, you know, the battle. Nimitz takes that opportunity to sort of rearrange all of the carrier task forces and put a number of them under under new people. Um, but I don't know when Halsey actually goes back out. Sorry. I, just, I, I think if I remember correctly, it's somewhere during the Guadalcanal campaign because he's not in charge of the carrier's um for all the good it would have done during first Savo Island, Fletcher's there. Right. But he's back in command by Santa Cruz. Um, well, he obviously, you know... Yeah, he's, somewhere, he's, along, the, somewhere I, along the line he shows back up again. Well, by the time we get to Santa Cruz, he's actually the theater commander. He's mm. no longer a task force commander at all. Um, mm. So, you know, I, I'm... I'm not sure that Halsey was ever in charge of another carrier task force af- after Midway, to be to be quite yeah. honest. Yeah, fair enough. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, A. Robere asks, if the Doolittle raid didn't happen, so Enterprise and Hornet are available for Coral Sea and managed to sink the Japanese, all the Japanese carriers there, would the Japanese have still gone forward with Midway? Um, again, my crystal ball. Um, my guess is yes. Uh, I, I think that if, if there's one thing that the Japanese sort of demonstrated throughout the war, it's kind of an, an obduracy when it comes to uh, keeping their, their previous campaigns going, whether or not it made sense or not. Um, I think that they, my guess is that they probably would have looked at Coral Sea as an aberration and said, well, you know, Cruiser Division Five, you know, those are the those are the new boys on the block. They don't really know what they're doing here. Let's we'll we'll bring uh, or Carrier Division Five, excuse me. Uh, we'll bring Cardiff One and Two. There are pros, and you know, even if it's a stand up fight with the Americans, we'll still be able to beat them. That'd be my guess, but who knows? Yeah. Um, Major Problem Forty Two asks, how much has the historiography changed with additional Japanese language sources? And what work still needs to be done to further our understanding of the Japanese perspective in the West? Great question. Um, I will tell you that since the publication of the book, which was 15 years ago, there haven't been a lot of new uh, Japanese sources that have been translated into English. Some of that is due to the fact that, you know, the book is done. I'm Mm. (laughs) I, I have problems enough keeping up with the American scholarship on this battle every so often when a new book comes out, let alone, you know, I don't read Japanese, so I don't mm. have the ability to just, you know, go to go to Tokyo and, and cruise the bookstores and, and buy new stuff and read it, unfortunately. Mm. Um, if I were a multimillionaire, uh, absolutely the thing that I would spend several million dollars on doing 
is hiring a team of translators and translating every single volume of Senshi Sosho, which is their war history series, into English. Um, because it would be absolutely invaluable. At this point, only three of those 120-some volumes have been translated into English. Uh, Stephen Ballard at the Australian uh, War Memorial has done a translation of the volume on the Kokoda Track campaign, which is super cool. And the Netherlands has translated both the Navy and the Army volumes for uh, the Dutch East Indies campaign uh, during the beginning part of the war. Those are the three that I know of. Um, John Lundstrom has a, a hand-done English translation of the Coral Sea volume in his personal possession, and he's using it for a new history on that battle, which uh, which he is actually working on with Tony Tully, which is going to be <laughs> cool. Um, but, yeah, I, there's just not enough of that, and it would be so valuable to have, if nothing else, just their war history series uh, in English, let alone all the other secondary sources that are over that, over there. I, I, I think we're going to get to that point. I mean, you know, again, the fact that I can take my phone with Google Translate and, and I did this recently. It was really cool. Um, I pointed it at the Korean version of, of Shattered Sword, which got done in the last couple of years and, you know, took a picture of it in Google Translate, you know, and it was pretty, pretty damn credible. So, you know, I, I think that technology is eventually going to erase these boundaries, but they ain't gone yet. Yeah, I must admit, actually, one of the questions I got a little while back was what what was the Circle 5 and Circle 6 actual programs? And I don't know if there is a English source out there, but for the life of me, I couldn't find one that told me what it was. And then eventually someone pointed out the Sensei Shoho series. Sensei. Yeah, yep. and of course that that volume is not translated into English, but someone no. who um, is a, was able to read and translate Japanese and had access to a copy then sent me a list, and I was like, ah, now we know yep. what they're, now I know what they're actually going to build. There, there was actually um, a series of articles that Eric Lacroix uh, put together back in the 1970s or 80s. Eric Lacroix is the author of um, co-author of the enormous uh, Japanese cruisers of World War II volume that was published by the Naval Institute Press, mm. and and those of us in the in the trade uh, refer to it as as the crew bible, the cruiser mm. bible, because it's it's like it's yay thick, and but it may well be the most authoritative reference book that has ever been written on anything, as far as I can tell. I mean, let alone the Japanese Navy. It's it's an incredibly valuable work. LaCroix uh, had a series of monographs that came out in a Dutch publication. It's in English. It's in the Naval Academy's library, for sure. But he goes through each of those uh, replenishment programs, Circle 3, Circle 4, Circle 5, and and not only highlights what was being built, but in many cases shows the budgetary figures and how much, uh, how many yen we're talking per ship as well, which is really cool stuff for a nerd like me. <laughs> yeah, that's the kind of information that it's like it's like yes, tell me more. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, I'm 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 trying to see if I can get uh, Japanese cruisers of the Pacific War reprinted, but it's going to be an up a bit of an uphill. Well, yeah, and unfortunately, the Naval Institute Press really doesn't do books like that anymore, um, mm. which is a shame because, yeah, that book is is worth its weight in gold. It's it's just amazing. Anyway. Yeah. Um, right. So what have we got else? Um, blah, blah, blah. You can't be running out of questions. No, no, no. I was just there's a there, there's an awful lot of what ifs. <laughs> so I'm yeah, trying. I'm trying to. I don't know what it is about this battle that leads mm. to that, but the amount of counterfactual speculation on this particular mm. battle is just it, it'll never end, you know. And and people could rattle off scenarios until the sun explodes. But yeah, it's it's a real feature of this battle. Um, 
try not to uh, close the entire thing. That would be bad. Um, I'm just telling Brian Redman it's, it's Senshi Shoho is the series. It's um, Sosho. Sosho. Yeah. Sosho. Right, Sosho. Right, there we go. Um, Frank Spazzato, um asks, ah, yes, did did you ever meet um, the recently lamented um, James Hornfisher? Jim Hornfisher was my literary agent. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I met him on several occasions. And he is very much lamented. Uh, it's funny, I was just thinking, he, he actually, he came up to Minneapolis uh, a few years ago to a funeral. And he was sitting with me in this very room. And we were sharing a little bourbon. Mm -hmm. And um, my phone went off. And I have a custom ringtone. I, um, I took a, a Depeche Mode track, uh, World in My Eyes, and turned it into, you know, the, the first 10 seconds of my phone ringtone. So my phone goes off, start reaching for it, and Jim is like, oh, that's my phone. And I pull out my phone to show him that it's mine that's ringing. And it's then that he realizes that he, too, had taken the same song and turned it into his ringtone. <laughs> <laughs> We were kind of like, you know, brothers of, of different mothers, you know, mm -hmm. and, and when I showed him that on my phone, he just, he was a huge man, a big man, you know, six foot four, and just head back in this huge garrulous laugh. You just thought it was hilariously funny that, you know, we would have the same, the same custom ringtones. He was a great guy. I just, I loved him to death, and uh, the occasions that I had to actually sit down and have dinner with him um, and just kind of, you know, shoot, shoot the talk with him. Um, a, a great guy, very knowledgeable, very important to the success of Shattered Sword and that he was able to, you know, hone in on the important stuff. Uh, I, I miss him to death. And it's, it's, a, it's an incredible shame that he's gone. And uh, as a cancer survivor myself, I say screw cancer. And, uh, yeah, Jim, fair winds and following seas, friend. Yeah, I, I had I only had a very brief opportunity to kind of kind of work with him because World of Warships invited him to the first mm. um, the first armchair admiral series that we did. Uh -oh. So I had about nice. 10 minutes to talk to him beforehand, about five minutes after and then kind of bouncing off each other during the session. But, yeah, he yeah. seemed like a really from that brief encounter, at least, obviously, I didn't know him anywhere near as well as you did, but he seemed like a, a very nice, a very nice man. And yep. yeah, it is a shame because he, he, he was on my, he was on my list of people to, uh, to approach for interviews, but. And, and he would have done it too. He had been, he'd have been happy to do it. Um, that's the kind of cat he was. So um, yeah. Yeah. Well, a huge a loss. Yeah. Um, Lorraine Booger asks, several sources mention how the dock workers remained on Yorktown, continuing repairs even after she left Pearl Harbor to bat the Battle of Midway. Um, was their presence on board a significant reason why Yorktown was repaired so quickly after Hiryu's dive bombers attacked her that the torpedo squadron then thought they were attacking a different carrier? No. Um, and in fact, I'm not sure whether or not there were actually civilians on there or not. I, I would really have to dig into the American side of the battle in a little more detail to know that. And that's actually a question that was raised recently, and I realized I don't really actually know. Because there are some accounts from the American side uh, where the dockyard workers get word that we're about to unmoor here. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you should leave now while the getting is good. So... I don't know if there were, and if so, how many. Um, I don't think that they would have had a significant impact on Yorktown's ability to repair her damage because damage control was kind of like the U.S. Navy's Bible. I mean, they do that all the time. There were plenty of guys on Yorktown who knew what to do when it came to damage control. Mm. Um yeah, and I mean to to be honest, the fact U.S. damage control generally was was pretty good, especially after the lessons of Coral Sea. Um, I mean, heck, they, given the battering Yorktown would later take at Santa Cruz, it took another couple of waves to to put her in a position where they thought it was irrecoverable. Yeah, Hornet, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Hornet. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
No, and, and you know, you, you look at Yorktown at, at Midway. Um, if if Tanabe had not gotten lucky in in I one sixty eight, the submarine that sank her, you know, he managed to duck underneath a thermal and got underneath American sonar and put in a a, a brilliant attack. Yorktown was in no danger of going down. We were going to drag her clear of that battlefield. She was going to survive. Honestly, kind of the same thing with Hornet. Um, If we hadn't had to have exited the battlefield because the Japanese were coming in, um, yeah, she was was a mess, but she was still floating. Uh, I think we would have hauled her out of there and and, uh, been able to repair. The Yorktown trio were incredibly resilient vessels they were very well designed and uh, yeah you couple that with with good damage control training on the part of of the crewmen and they were very durable ships yeah um robert manos asks um do you have any opinions on the finding of the wrecks some of the wrecks of midway recently um and how much trouble will hear you be to find next (laughs) Well, okay, so the problem there, um, actually, Tony Tully worked with Paul Allen's group uh, very closely and was was a, an important part to, to help them actually locate the two carriers that they did find, Kaga and Akagi. Um, although, you have to keep in mind, too, that, that Paul Allen had sufficient resources that 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 ship, if need be, could just lawnmower the ocean, you know, back and forth <laughs> until they, they, they find it. The problem now is that Paul is gone, and the executor of Paul's estate is his sister, and his sister just doesn't see any value in those activities. And so, unfortunately, uh, the petrol has been laid up, and her crew has been furloughed, and there is no indication that they are going to go back out with her ever again. So that chapter, at least for the time being, seems to have been closed. And that, to me, is uh, a matter of great disappointment. Personally, just I don't, I don't know what it is, but there had always been a part of me that wanted to be on the expedition that found Akagi. Akagi is my favorite Japanese warship. I I would have killed to have gone out and actually been a part of that. So, you know, it's disappointing not to have been part of that. But if nothing else, having found her wreck, I at least wanted them to put an ROV down on her and see what she looked like. I think that having found those two ships, there was absolutely no question that Soryu was going to be located shortly thereafter. Um, And then, obviously, the last target would be Hiryu, and it wouldn't have surprised me if they'd gone after Makuma as well. Um, So it's a bummer uh, Mm. not to have found those locations, because I think that if the sinking locations were known, that would tell us things about, you know, what was the carrier formation uh, at the time of the attack, and or that would give us more information about um, the movements of some of those vessels after they were bombed as well, that there was a real opportunity here to add to our understanding of what actually went down during the battle. And I, I mourn the fact that it doesn't look like we're going to get that. Hmm. Yeah, so it is a shame. I didn't realize that about petrol. I thought she was just laid up because of COVID. But, yeah. Doesn't look that way. Yeah, that's a shame. Yeah. Um, Ivan J O five asks: Is there a a book uh, like comparable to Shattered Sword for the American side of Midway? I would say there's not an all-in-one solution uh, to to the American side, and, and it's funny. I've got a great big pile of them sitting back behind me in case we needed to look any of them up. Um, I don't know that I have a favorite. Uh, I think that I think that Walter Lord's book, even though some of the operational details are are uh, now superseded, still reads wonderfully. It's just just a marvelous piece of history, 
Uh, if you want to get into the nitty gritty on Fletcher, you really got to do uh, Lundstrom's uh, Black Shoe Carrier Admiral. I think that uh, an underappreciated volume is is Cressman's uh, A Glorious Page in Our History. There's a lot of good operational detail in that book that's worth looking at. So I, you know, and 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 of course Craig Simon's recent uh, Battle of Midway. Again, a very useful work, and he really drills into some of the scholarship around the flight to nowhere in a way that no one else has, has done previously. So, no, I don't think there is any one volume that has mm-hmm. the whole American side of the battle. I think you got to really, you got to read a bunch. Fair enough. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, right, we're, we're now coming up to two hours, <laughs> believe it or not. I am probably going to check out here pretty okay. pretty soon, but unless you've got something that's just earth-shatteringly important that we need to answer. Um, okay, so let, let well, let's find one last question for you then, and let's then we can um, let let you go and have some rest. Yeah. Um, actually, that's quite a nice one. Um, oh. Now I've selected the question. It's another one of these people I can't pronounce their names of. Um, anyway, a person, another another person with a name that is difficult to pronounce asks, um, do you think the history of the Pacific War is more biased compared to the history of the European War? Especially, obviously, given the language barriers between Western and Japanese historians compared to German versus uh, English speaking. That is a fascinating question. And and how would that bias manifest itself, I guess? And that, that would be kind of my follow-up question is, it, it seems, there seems, I don't want to put this in a bad way, but it's kind of a loaded question. It's like there's a presupposition that there's bias. How does that bias manifest itself? Mm. Um, I do think that if you look at the study of the Pacific War in general, um, of, of course the winners write write the history books, right? Mm-hmm. You know, so we're we're the good guys, and and the Japanese are the bad guys. And but there is also some some uh, objective information to to kind of back up that uh, that viewpoint in that. If you look at the Japanese occupation of a number of the Asian countries that they were in charge of, I think you can make a pretty credible argument that uh, it's it's not just American bias to say that they behaved in, in a terrible way and, and were absolutely awful to the people uh, who they, they lorded it over. I Getting down to the level of history, though, I'm not sure how I would actually answer that. I, I think, again, I wish that there were more Japanese materials on Midway. I wish that there were more Japanese materials in, in English, I guess I would mm. say, uh, on a number of the campaigns. And that's something that I've run into in this 1942 project just all over the place. Um, you know, at this point, there's really only two decent books that have been written on uh, the Burma campaign that have Japanese names anywhere in the co-authors. I don't think that there's a good Japanese uh, history that has been translated on the Philippine campaign. So, you know, the fact that we don't have a good insight into a lot of uh, their activities, Certainly, when you get to the later war, you get survivor accounts. I mean, if you go to a battlefield like Peleliu uh, or Iwo Jima, you can find uh, survivor accounts around what what those campaigns were like. But in a lot of cases, those are written from the points of view of common soldiers, you know. And with all due respect to those sorts of accounts, they're very valuable for sort of portraying um, what the day-to-day life in combat was like, but they're not necessarily as good at giving you the operational perspective from the perspective of the commanders as to the, the sort of problems that they were being faced with. So I, I feel like I'm meandering mm-hmm. here. Um, 
I'm not sure how that bias would manifest itself. I am absolutely sure that I wish that there were more good source materials uh, from the Japanese side that have been translated into English. Fair enough. Thank you. And well, yeah, and th thank you for your um, uh, for your participation in this um, in this stream. It's been absolutely fantastic having you again um, on the channel. And uh, it's been super fun. Yeah, I I really enjoy uh, this sort of a uh, venue and and being able to operate in space. I mean, hmm. it's it's so cool for me to see frankly, the level of expertise that we have in a lot of the people that are asking these questions, there's, there's obviously still an interest in this topic. The people are out there doing the reading and asking really, really credible questions. So, yeah, th uh, thank you to our audience uh, for having uh, made this a really fun afternoon for me, too. <laughs> That's always good to know. And uh, obviously, we will be... Um... We will be cooperating on uh, on something else in the future. So, yep. spoilers, Absolutely. everyone, watch out for that. Yep. Um, sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll let you go now. Uh, other than say, obviously, um, if at all you need any resources from the National Archives over here in Kew, just drop me a line because I'm twenty minute drive away, and uh, there's there's a lot of. Um, there's a lot of stuff there, but I mean, I've already got the Eastern, most of the Eastern Fleet operational documents around the time of the Indian Ocean raid um, okay. scanned. But yeah, anything you need from National Archives, let me know. I'll happily take a trip down. There's actually a document from Montgomery that I'm looking mm -hmm. for on uh, British armor doctrine uh, okay. around Alamein. But yeah, different. Well, if you, if uh, it doesn't, re it doesn't really matter what document it is. If you, if you know the reference, if the the the, the reference yeah. I need to give them to pull the record, I'll quite happily go and do that. Oh, cool! Great. I'm, I'm a bit of a terror to them with my ridiculously fast scanner setup. Right. <laughs> everyone, everyone else is there thinking they're clever with a camera, and there's there's right. me with fast scanners and all sorts of things. But anyway, sorry. All right. I'll let, no let you go. All right. Thank you very Thanks much, everyone. and uh, see you later. Thank you, sir. Yep. Talk to you soon. See you soon. Right, that is right. So that is uh, John, John Partial, everybody. Excellent, um, excellent gentleman. And right now I'm back. Uh, so the stream isn't quite over yet. Um, uh, so I'm here still. Uh, I'll pick up a few more questions, and then I will probably also wrap things up um, at some point within the next hour or so. Um, because, yeah, this is a little bit of a marathon, um, but it's a good one. Um, so hopefully everybody there enjoyed enjoyed John's uh, appearance. I know I certainly did. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to run through a few questions that I saw that I think merit, definitely merit an answer, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I can um, answer them myself. Uh, <laughs> so let's... Let's get on to with those. Um, uh, Fraser Watt, and I know this was being discussed um, during during the stream in the chat, says, can you come up with a suggestion as to why the Americans insisted on building carriers with wooden flight decks as opposed to UK carriers having armoured metal flight decks? Um, and as was pointed out, you know, wood as the overall covering for the flight deck is good for grip and so forth. But the I do have a whole video going into this, um, but the fundamental reason why the US went for the unarmoured flight deck and the armour level being at the hangar deck as opposed to the UK carriers which had the armour level at the flight deck um, which had knock-on effects on air group size and such like basically comes down to pre-war exercises. Now pre-war exercises before obviously before radar seemed to indicate that if you launched a strike on a carrier then because of the increasing speed of aircraft in the 1930s you couldn't have you couldn't keep a meaningful combat air patrol up um even though the doctrine of combat air patrol wasn't really so much a thing in the in the mid in the mid 30s but basically whatever happened you couldn't get a meaningful number of fighters up to intercept them before those strike aircraft showed up right over your decks and started bombing you so it seemed that a strike that found a carrier was a strike that would kill a carrier. And this led to a number of different um, doctrinal developments in, in 
the various navies, especially the US and the UK. In the US, they decided the best way of dealing with this was to have the biggest air group possible, so you hit the enemy first, because then they can't kill you if you've killed them. And in the expanses of the Pacific, there's less, less theoretical risk of uh, land-based aircraft getting involved. And also it meant you had more fighters available, um, which meant that if you were lucky and you had an outlying scout or something that could report it, you could get a, a big fighter defence up. And it also led to the US coming up with a doctrine which you see at Coral Sea and Midway of having their, and even to be honest by Eastern Solomons and Santa Cruz, of having the carriers operating in their own individual groups with their own separate escorts. And the idea of that was that if a strike group came in, saw a carrier, attacked it and sunk it, they'd only sunk one. So if you have multiple carriers, the other carriers can get revenge. So that was kind of the US's answer to the whole problem. The British answer to the problem was based... They had the same sort of data to go with, but they also had the additional problem that they were pretty sure they were going to be fighting somewhere in Europe at some point pretty soon. And that meant you would have to be within range of land-based aircraft. And land-based aircraft could be bigger, heavier, more numerous, and more persistent than carrier-based aircraft, simply because you can have multiple airfields and airfields are bigger and can support heavier aircraft as well. And you see this in the Mediterranean, where you have three, four, five hundred sorties launched almost on a rolling basis, day after day, against various convoys trying to get to Malta and such. And so the British concluded that it didn't matter how many fighters you you put on your carrier, you could you would in those circumstances be overwhelmed. And they also concluded it didn't matter how well you spaced out your ships, because that many aircraft are going to find and attack pretty much all your carriers. So they came to the conclusion that without radar, the only because obviously this is pre-radar, the only way for your carriers to survive would be to basically be protected against the strikes. And in the mid, early to mid-1930s, when these design decisions are being taken, that means you have to resist a 500 to 550 pound bomb. So, hence you get this sort of three, three and a bit inch flight deck, because that is what is, that is enough they calculate to resist a, a bomb of approximately that weight. And they also actually have a very heavy anti-aircraft armament. If you look at the, and again in the carrier comparison video that I did on this, if you actually look at the number of guns per tonne, British carriers, Ark Royal and Illustrious, as built, actually have a much heavier anti-aircraft concentration than American carriers like the Yorktowns, as built. Obviously that does change over time as more and more guns are added, but the British carriers, at, when they're originally constructed in the 30s, are basically as far as 1930s warships go, bristling anti-aircraft platforms that are designed to take multiple hits and keep on trucking. And that's just the, that's the reason they go for it. Whereas if... Uh, and you, you kind of can see the change between Ark Royal, which is much more, much more along the lines of how the Yorktowns are built, versus the Illustriouses, because back when Ark Royal is designed, they're mainly thinking about the, the enemy being Japan. Pacific War, wide open distances, you need more aircraft to operate, you get something like Ark Royal. By the mid, mid to late 30s, they're thinking about a war in Europe, close confines, lots of land-based aircraft, as I said, and suddenly you spit out something like the Illustrious class. The weird thing was that by the end of the war, when you've got the super carriers that both nations are developing, so the midways which the US actually builds, and the Maltas which the UK almost builds but doesn't, there's actually a little bit of cross-pollination if you like in that the midways have stepped away from the Yorktown and Essex style and they have a British style armoured flight deck and the Maltas have gone more towards an open hangar uh, arrangement or at least a partly opened hangar which is the, one of the US solutions to get as many aircraft prepped and ready as possible so th there's kind of this convergent evolution between US and British carriers which is arriving at kind of a hybrid which is actually what you then see taken forward into things like the Forestals and such, like in, in the post-war period. Um, someone pointing out that the US eventually going with £1,000 bombs. Um, the the US did go, end up going in the 
uh, mid to late 1930s with thousand pound bombs um, when it came to uh, going after en enemy carriers and ships generally. Um, there was a bit of a shock for some people. Um, the British weren't ne surprised per se at the use of thousand pound bombs because obviously land-based aircraft could use thousand pound bombs and as it turned out, 2,000 pound bombs. Um, but everyone was a little bit shocked, dash impressed, depending on who you're talking about, that American carrier-based aircraft would ca were carrying around 1,000 pound bombs. The idea of carrying a payload that heavy wasn't that unusual because torpedoes weigh more than that, but the idea that you could get a somewhat useful dive bomber that was trucking around a single big bomb like that was actually quite, quite impressive. Um, and... Uh, where was it? Someone said. Um, Kilgore asking, are you going to visit USS New Jersey? Yes, if I manage to get over there. Um, if I manage to get over to the States, it's it's just one of those things of dependent. And Steve Windish, it, it's not that the British carriers are better, the, better at everything. What they're better at is surviving. Uh, and I've made this point before, like the, the hit that, uh, the hits that, the dive bomber hits in at both Coral Sea and Midway that ripped badly damaged Yorktown would not have troubled a British carrier, but those armoured flight decks come with a big drawback, or well, two big drawbacks, one of which is not necessarily felt immediately, but is felt post-war, which is that because you've got all this weight of the flight decks much higher up in the ship, you can't build the ship as tall because it's going to affect your stability in a negative way. So the British carriers end up going with this 14-foot height hangar, which is just about enough to fit the aircraft they've got. Um, so that's fine for the minute, but as aircraft get larger, they cannot fit. So um, even and they're even running into this problem in the mid to late part of World War II. So if you've ever seen a Seafire, the uh, seaborne variant of the Spitfire, most carrier-based aircraft that have upwardly folding wings, they have their wings kind of fold up like this. It's relatively simple. The problem was that if you did that with a sea fire, if you folded it up a little bit like that, then um, you had a very wide uh, base wing route, which made it very difficult to store. And if you folded them in a way that made them relatively easy to store quite high, then you'd lose the tips of your wings every time you try to move them around the hangar. So you end up with this kind of very weird, um, on the sea fire, they have main folding wings and then little tiny reverse folding wing tips so they kind of end up doing this um, which is a bit odd um just to fit in the hangar and post-war it's it's pretty much it, it's done the the the, the armoured carriers are done for as far as being frontline units are concerned because they cannot fit the vast majority of the new jet jets that are being used these bigger and heavier aircraft and so you, you actually end up with the light fleet carrier program, carriers that were only supposed to last a couple of years, actually being used more um, in the post-war environment than the supposed fleet carriers of both the illustrious and implacable classes. Um, so that's a, that's a slightly longer term downside. The, uh, the shorter term downside was that because you've got all this extra weight, not just the stability issues up top, but the, this armour taking up all this extra weight generally... The British carriers are physically smaller than American carriers, and that means they can't fit as many aircraft in the hangar. Um, the air groups initially appear to be way lower, um, even though with some of them having double height hangars, technically having slightly more hangar space, because the Yorktowns and such are single, single uh, deck hangars. Um, but they, they can't fit as many aircraft in overall. Now, as I say, part of that is because the US is, uses deck parking, which they they can do because of the Pacific weather conditions the British can't do. And once you get into the Pacific and the British start deck parking, their, car their air groups do go up um, and begin to approach more like US carrier air group levels. But they are still less than um, American carriers. And... Part of that is in terms of just aircraft they can actually deploy. And the other part is if you look at some of the photos of the interiors of Yorktown and Essex class carriers and even the Lexingtons, because their um, hangars can be so much higher, they actually have a lot of spare aircraft lashed to the ceiling in bits. 
and that can lead to some confusion as to whether or not what exactly is the aircraft count aboard because some sources will tell you this is how many airframes are aboard a carrier and people will take that and run with it when in fact it may be that a dozen or two dozen of them are lashed up spares in pieces and don't actually count towards the total operational strength um, and other sources are a bit more careful about the clarifying the difference between operational and non-operational aircraft but what it means is that if you have an aircraft that comes in and it has to ditch but the pilot is recovered or it crash lands and the pilot is recovered or it's just shot up um so badly that it's not able to be repaired you just have to tip it over the side on a british carrier that means you now have a pilot almost certainly without an aircraft unless you get an aircraft back intact and the pilot's crippled for some reason Whereas on an American carrier, to a certain degree, they can just go, okay, right, well, that's another Hellcat written off. Winch down the spare, and as long as the pilot's in a vaguely flying condition, you can have him back up and running within 24 hours. Um, and, of course, because the British are designing their carriers, their armoured carrier, armored flight deck carriers, just for air groups that are going to be sitting inside the hangar, so mu much smaller than they eventually end up with in the Pacific... They also spec the bomb load and the aircraft fuel load for an air group of that size. And they do run into this problem in the Pacific where they've got these much larger air groups than before deployed. So that's good. And the Sea Fire is in great demand as an interceptor um, because it's just so fast climbing. But they don't have the time on station of the Essex class because after a while they just start running out of aviation fuel and munitions and they have to cycle back so that there there are swings and roundabouts it's it's one and of course the royal navy also has night attack capabilities on its carriers well before everybody else but it's, it's one of these swings and roundabout things it's like if you put a yorktown in the place of say illustrious when it's bombed in the mediterranean 99.9 .9 percent that carrier would have been lost whereas illustrious survives thanks to its armoured flight deck, because even though there are some really big bombs do penetrate it, the fact that the fuse is initiated by hitting that flight deck so high up means the bombs blow up high in the ship rather than low in the ship, which would obviously open up the sides of the ship and or cripple the machinery and then the carrier's done for. Um, but the flip side is if you put, the like we're talking about today, if you put the British armoured carriers at midway, sure, like the hits that take down Yorktown a British armoured carrier probably would have walked off but at the same time you're you're going to be looking at sending what swordfish to dive bomb Akagi and Karga and and or try and torpedo them and with the best will in the world to the swordfish it's not a dauntless it might have better luck than a devastator although that's not exactly a very high bar to clear but I, you can't see swordfish squadrons during the day having anything like the same level of success that the US Dauntless dive bomber squadrons did. You could make an argument that maybe they'll attack at night when the Japanese aren't wet, ready and uh, ready for them. But then, as as John was saying, that's sort of counterfactuals going on counterfactuals and butterflies going away. Um, and as Kilgore pointing out, um, and as I said earlier, yes, the US carriers they do carry armor, but their armor is at the hangar deck level rather than the flight deck level which i mean occasionally it does cause some problems if you um look at what happened to franklin and bunker hill but you know there's a it, it's all over the place um with these kinds of things so anyway before it turns into a a, a rehash of my <laughs> armored carriers video uh, versus such swordfish dive bombing i can't get out right mm. Possibly, I mean, it's not a swordfish float plane, so they might actually have a forward airspeed, but you never know. Um, so that's that. Um, uh, so how uh, one just asks how effective was Japanese damage control and anti-aircraft fire at Midway? The AA fire wasn't brilliant, but I mean, Japanese aircraft and fire anti-aircraft fire per gun effectiveness wasn't brilliant throughout most of the war. Um, in terms of their damage control, it wasn't that effective. That wasn't to say the Japanese were absolutely terrible at damage control. It 
comes down again and again i've actually done a damage control video as well but it comes down to two lines of, of factors one of which is that the japanese don't have anywhere near as many extras as the u.s carriers do so you wouldn't believe on a, on a carrier that's 800 plus foot long something that you can manhandle with one hand making much of a difference but it does and that's the portable pump the portable diesel powered pumps that u.s carriers began to be supplied with and would have increasing numbers of throughout the war and that's mainly for firefighting and things like that but just simple things like that allow them to fight fires at times when the main firefighting mains are either damaged out of commission or just can't be reached because you know everything's on fire so that there's a, there is a technology issue there but there is the other factor which is that um the japanese damage control they rely on specialist damage control teams and everyone else has their own jobs they get on with those whereas on american carriers everyone has a role in damage control and that means that if you end up in a situation like say Karga, where pretty much your entire damage control team is wiped out in the that first attack there is no longer really anyone to coordinate or the damage control efforts who knows what they're doing nor is there much of anybody available who actually knows what they're doing uh, i mean Karga is pretty much doomed anyway given the number of bomb hits she takes but you know they're they're even more doomed as a result of having their damage control teams wiped out um on a kagi the some of the damage control crews are still around um but this is where the the, the low manpower and the small numbers of uh, 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 of portable equipment comes in because they're just feeding initially the damage control crew there they can't quite fight the fires and it, then they lose them to you know the massive fires and explosions and eventually on akagi they're just feeding men into the damage control effort which is kind of slowing the fires down a little bit but it ultimately doesn't save them um obviously and as um someone else is pointing out in uh, tony scolari yes the other problem is that some of the equipment the main a damage control equipment on Japanese carriers is not particularly well designed so part of that is the resilience of the carriers themselves part of that is the resilience of the damage control efforts so if your say aviation fuel tanks are built into the carrier that might seem like a good idea but it means that any shock on the carrier like say a bomb hitting you is going to carry through the hull and it's going to potentially rupture those fuel tanks and then you have aviation fuel all over the place which makes things a lot worse whereas if you design a carrier with the fuel tanks built separately uh, what we call floating or isolated from the ship then that initial shock wave is much less likely to actually damage the the fuel tanks that aren't in the immediate vicinity of the blast and so you don't have to worry about thousands of gallons of aviation fuel spilling everywhere and potentially catching fire or exploding. The other part is it, it goes with the damage control equipment, which is things like the water ring mains. How redundant are they and what are they made of? And again, are they floating or are they built into the ship's structure? If you build, um, as the Japanese did on some of their carriers, if you build the water distribution mains out of, out of um, very hard, brittle iron they're going to be pretty strong right up until you hit them with something that's strong enough to crack them so not glass but kind of like glass pretty pretty strong but then they just break and that's it and when it breaks the game over you ain't repairing that anytime soon whereas if you have your mains with more redundancy built out of slightly more ductile materials and not hard bolted to the rest of the structure then they have much more opportunity to flex and move with shockwaves they're much less likely to break unless you score an absolute direct hit on them in which case hopefully the redundancies will take over instead um, and if they are damaged because of the duct their ductile nature they're much easier to repair because the damage is most likely to be confined to physically a relatively small area as opposed to if you get a really uh, brittle iron pipe and it 
shatters that link that that crack is probably going to be dozens of feet long and there's no way with a high pressure water main under the process of battle that you're ever going to get that fixed so yeah this thing this is the thing japanese damage control if the damage control systems are intact and if the main and if the professional damage control crew is intact theoretically will work very well and there are occasions where that does happen and the ship survives but you're relying on two very key very vulnerable systems surviving in an environment where people are dropping bombs on you and possibly torpedoes as well <laughs> which is you know relying on people surviving in a situation where half the ship's just been blown up is not exactly the world's best recipe <laughs> So, Johann Schmidt asks, what was Nagumo's fate after the defeat at Midway? Was he finally relegated to a junior position or relieved? Well, no. Um, he was still in command. Um, he was in command of some of the operations during Guadalcanal. And it's only during the, the much later part of the war that he gets um, sidelined in favour of other commanders. Adam Downey, the US Navy won the... Uh, the US Navy won the Pacific Carrier Air War through the attrition of Japanese aircrew. Therefore, could they have achieved victory without sinking a single Japanese carrier? Hmm. Theoretically, yes. Because when you look at something like the Battle of Leyte Gulf, the Japanese problem is not building carriers. The Japanese problem is not building aircraft. The Japanese problem is maintaining the level of skilled pilots that don't get chewed up in a mission or two as as uh, john partial was saying earlier so and and so they're down by the battle of cape engano they're down to basically being a decoy force so yes in theory you could have just attritioned the japanese air corps out of existence uh, without ever touching a japanese carrier hull but that would have made things a lot harder because, well, one, the US doesn't necessarily know how many trained Japanese pilots remain. Um, and also, the um, a lot of, well, not a lot, but a, a fair number of Japanese losses when it comes to their pilots come from things like at Midway when the strike aircraft are in the hangars and the carrier gets blown up with them inside it. So that pilots are lost there. Um, some pilots, when their carrier is sunk, are lost because they try to ditch and not, are not picked up, or that's the last last flight deck that's available. All sorts of things like this. So those eat into Japanese pilot losses as well. So if the Japanese carriers are never hit and never sunk, those pilots at least are going to survive, which, of course, the longer the experienced pilots survive then the more they have for the next battle and so on and so forth. Now, granted, the fact that US air anti-air firepower is just chewing up and spitting out Japanese aircraft like there's no tomorrow, it's not going to win the war for them, but it might extend the war slightly. Um, USS Grey Ghost, how good was Enterprise's helmsman? Well, if you've seen the videos in the dry dock of... Uh, <laughs> Enterprise basically doing the Tokyo drift with a with a sort of a, a twenty thousand ton plus carrier, he was good, and you know Enterprise survived. Got a bit battered, but it survived. So yeah, uh, Carrie Reisberg would having the fairy swordfish instead of a Douglas Devastator have affected torpedo delivery. Um, not tremendously. I mean the swordfish was very rugged, and surprisingly so actually i mean you know they've got the whole thing with bismarck um and military history visualized an excellent video on why the swordfish would not die versus anti uh, the anti-aircraft fire from bismarck on the other hand the swordfish is not invincible you look at um the channel dash and the massacre of the swordfish that happened when they tried to go after the two shan horse and prince eugen in in that engagement so it is possible to shoot down a swordfish quite decisively Effectively, what it comes down to with the swordfish is that because they're fabric in canvas, incidental hits and shrapnel, unless the, you get very lucky and hit something vital like the pilot or the engine, don't trouble it too much unless they really build up. Whereas with a stress skin, all metal monoplane, 
hits almost anywhere can have a significantly compromising effect um, on the aircraft. So if it's swordfish instead of devastators, it's possible just because of their weird durability that slightly more swordfish will survive to drop their torpedoes. But given the number of Japanese fighters that are involved and given, you know, whilst we might say Japanese anti-aircraft firepower is bad, it still is a fleet's worth of anti-aircraft firepower. I don't think the swordfish are going to have survival rates in terms of getting back to their carriers that are much better than the Devastators. They might get a few more torpedoes into the water, though, um, and whether or not that lands a few extra hits, who knows. Um, but yeah, it's kind of... If if you if you ha send a, have a swordfish and a devastator, if you send them into a situation where they're attacking one or two ships, or there's a little bit of fighter opposition, the swordfish probably will survive significantly better. But when you're throwing low slow torpedo bombers into a midway kind of situation, I don't think there's really any torpedo bomber of the period that's going to come out looking good. Um, Captain Seafort, did either the Japanese Navy or the US Navy draw any significant carrier operational lessons from Operation C? Um, not particularly. Um, well, certainly none that they particularly uh, took on board. The Japanese should have learned a lesson about scouting um, from Operation C, which was under Nagumo. Um, obviously, as Midway showed, that lesson was not entirely learned. Um, if at all. The US Navy did have some feedback on Operation C from the British, um, obviously as a result, but to be honest, the British carriers, the two British carriers that were there, well, apart from Hermes, which obviously got sunk, but the two British fleet carriers that were present ended up doing some scouting missions and never actually engaging. So there wasn't a huge amount for to be drawn on in terms of carrier operational experience from from the allied side for operation c um it is a little bit of a damp squib other than to emphasize that you know carriers could act carrier fleets could actually get very very close to each other without spotting each other or in the case of uh the royal navy which did spot some of the japanese carriers that your scouting aircraft probably needed to be a little bit more capable than albacores <laughs> yeah, I think the the one thing I would say, one final thing I'd say, wrapping up the swordfish versus devastator question is, of course, the swordfish. Um, when you're deploying in squadrons, and there's a a radar equipped one in there, does have the capability to launch night attacks, which the devastator doesn't, which would vastly increase the swordfish's survivability because at night there's not going to be any fighters, and the chances of any of anyone having a proper nighttime anti-aircraft doctrine on ships are pretty remote. Uh, Malcolm 55, Operation C is with a formal name for the Japanese, what's commonly called the Indian Ocean Raid. So that's when Nagumo took a good chunk of the Kido Butai and tried to cleanse the Indian Ocean of Royal Navy presence. Um, so that ended up with um, Hermes, Cornwall and Dorset shirt being sunk, a bunch of other smaller stuff being sunk and one of one of possibly the greatest missed opportunities of all time when uh, Somerville with Warspite and two armoured carrier, armored flight deck carriers in the advance plus four R-class battleships bringing up the tail very nearly um, ended up running into elements of the Kido Butai in a night engagement but didn't quite. Um, more on that in a separate in a separate video but yeah that would have been very interesting. All I'll say on that in, in the work that I'm doing with uh, Jamie Seidel from Armand Carriers and Dr. Clark on it is if if you know, the butterfly had flapped its wings very slightly differently and Somerville had gotten the notification from his scouting albacore before it was shot down or the other albacore had not had its radio shot out, then we very well might have had the first answer to can a carrier sink another carrier being yes but with guns and i'll just leave that spoiler hanging for when we complete our work on that alfonso thado salviolo medina teles asked when did naval night fighters start operating depends on the navy 
Um, the US, the US had some night fighter initial night fighter operations starting in the very late part of forty three and going into early forty four. Um, but it was very heavily restricted to a handful of vessels. Enterprise and Saratoga, as time went on, became kind of the night fighter action vessels for the US Navy. For the Royal Navy, night fighting doctrine with their carriers was actually built in pre-war. Um, they had some initial thoughts about how to do it before radar, and once they had um, air-to-surface radar equipped they very quickly uh, evolved their night, night fighting and night attack techniques to inc include that. And that's where you get, I mean, operations like Taranto in 1940 is, is, you know, it's a night strike operation complete with nighttime navigation. And if this um, Operation C event had happened, then you would have had a nighttime carrier strike operation there. There were a number of other nighttime strikes going that went on before that. I mean, even uh, Matapan, the last attacks and the ones that actually nailed polar that were flown were flown they took off during daylight but they actually attacked during the hours of darkness and returned um during the hours of darkness um what not to do and how to do it well the japanese were the best in the night surely uh, the japanese were competing for top spot in night action night tra night battle training for their surface vessels not with the aircraft IP's asking, are you drinking from a flower vase? Uh, no, this is... Well, I don't think it's a flower vase. This is a, just a really big glass that you can get from Ikea. Um, as for what I'm drinking... Um, for the purpose of the stream, it is Coca-Cola. Um, it may be mixed with something else. <laughs> um, uh, Steve Martin... Martin Yusson asks, um, this, and this is backing up what uh, John Parshall was saying before he had to go, uh, it says, a Japanese friend of mine knows nothing of the atrocities, just that there was a glorious war. Um, yeah, that does unfortunately seem to be something of uh, a trend in some forms of um, quote-unquote history that's going on in that those areas. Um, then uh, Kurt Callahan. Um Midway is always framed as a must-win for the U.S. Wasn't it really the opposite? As Avengers were already being deployed, soon the U.S. would have superior fighters all built in large numbers. Um, yes and no would be my opinion. Um, the the two the two prom problems. I think Midway does have to be won by the U.S. for two main reasons. One of which is even with Coral Sea. Um, they've lost Lexington and Yorktown's been damaged. <clears throat> so at the point of Midway, they don't have any clear, decisive victories over the Japanese Navy, and that is affecting morale. Midway is needed in as much as they need a big win over the Japanese to show that they can get a big win over the Japanese um, in order to, you know, to buck up the morale of, of the US generally when it comes to this particular war. Um, plus, also, you've got to consider the knock-on effects. Yes, eventually the US will get the Essex Swarm. Eventually you'll get Hellcats and Avengers. But at the time that Midway is happening, Guadalcanal has yet to kick off. If they lose Midway, and commensurately, theoretically, they lose their carriers with it, they have virtually nothing. I mean, they'd have Saratoga and Wasp, and you know, we all know what happened to Wasp pretty quickly... Um, so they wouldn't really have much of anything in terms of carrier air support to help with the Guadalcanal campaign. And if they don't have carriers to help support the Guadalcanal campaign, there's a big open question as to does the Guadalcanal campaign even happen? And if it does happen, how how does it go? Um, if you if Wasp gets taken out and Saratoga is the only thing that's left, um, then well. Saratoga's good, but is it will survive the Battle of Santa Cruz Islands or the Battle of the Eastern Solomons good? Well, um, I'll leave you to make that decision. But yeah, it's it's one of the it, it's it's not so much the battle in and of itself. If the Japanese had tried to attack Midway, 
as in land on midway, there's a fairly good chance they won't actually be able to take it with the forces they've got deployed. But even if you just hand wave it and say they manage to take midway, um, it's not a devastating blow to the US war effort. The US war, and inevitably the US war effort, will catch up and will eventually overwhelm the Japanese. But in terms of in terms of the second half of 1942 kind of being a grinding attrition that gradually turns the Pacific campaign against the Japanese and then going into 43 with the Americans then being able to start taking the offensive, without if Midway is lost and the carriers are lost there, that won't happen, which, well, it's not going to drag the war out because the atomic bombs are still going to be a thing, but it does mean that the US is going to be significantly further away from the Japanese home islands come 45. Um, so, yeah. There we go. Um, <laughs> Mbini, um probably know your opinion on plan Z, Z but can you elaborate on the positive as well as the negative ideas of the topic um, I have an entire video dedicated to plan Z so um, I'd suggest um, having a look at that and then maybe following up with if I haven't covered what you want to know in there um, rather than just be rehashing the uh, that whole video here um, Rick Middleton what do you see Bismarck's future being if she hadn't been if she had not sunk hood um, probably still hunted down by the Royal Navy. Because, um, well, apart from anything, if she hadn't sunk Hood, then Hood and Prince of Wales are still going to keep shooting at her until Bismarck sinks. Uh, in theory, Bismarck could try motoring off into the sunset and gradually leave them behind, but she's still going to get hunted down. If she doesn't get hunted down for whatever reason somehow, well, she's now in the same boat as lit almost literally as Scharnhorst and Gneisenau now are in either Brest or San Nazia, or San Nazaire, as apparently it's called. Um, so, probably bombed, dash torpedoed there, the same, Nizer now almost was sunk. Um, if she survives that channel dash, probably hits mines, probably ends up in Norway at some point. Um... Trent Telenko chiming there, the full for the... The first full-time U.S. Navy night air group was Air Group 41, placed on the light carrier Independence with 14 F6Fs, uh, F6F5Ns, 5 F6F5s, and 12 TBM Avengers. Independence sailed for Eniwetok at the end of July 1944 to join Task Force 38. Well, there you go. Um, air Group 41 finished its tour in January 45, by which point it claimed 46 kills but lost 10 of its 35 night fighter pilots in action. Um, so yeah, there you go. Thank you very much, Trent. <laughs> um, right. Uh, so it's two hours forty-six, two hours forty-seven. So I'm going to wrap this up at the three-hour mark um, because I need to. Well, I'm not going to be doing any more video editing today, but there is video editing I do need to do um, for next week because, um, yeah, there's a. There's a fair bit of stuff I need to be doing, which is going to be uh, interesting, shall we say, to uh, manage. Yeah. That's mainly because I am, um, as I've mentioned in a couple of dry docks, I'm going to be, I'm going to be at Chalk Valley Living History Festival over the this coming weekend. So this coming weekend is not video editing or creating time for me. Um, Momar Diop, how were the Japanese survivors of Midway treated or perceived by those who were informed of the outcome of the battle and the loss of the carriers? Well, as uh, John Parshall mentioned earlier, the outcome of the battle of Midway was hidden very much from most of the Japanese public and a lot of the military as well. So, you know, it's... Uh, by the time it, the wider Japanese population got to know what had actually happened at Midway a lot of those survivors had died in subsequent operations or had become so sort of wound up in other things that it's just not going to really figure into into it in the way, in the way that say Jutland figures into um public consciousness in the immediate aftermath 
Um, excuse me. <clears throat> um, right. Let's have a look what else have we got. Uh, oh, yes. Um, Cody85 asks, what would be the result have been if the first and second carrier squadrons had switched to a second run on Port Moresby instead of the Midway operation? Um, they probably would have redeployed the US carriers to go after the second battle of the Coral Sea. <laughs> How that... Well, I mean, that's an interesting one, because if they had gone after for that, then you wouldn't have the initial massive strike the Japanese send at Midway Island. Um, you wouldn't have the uh, the sort of the potential confusion between are we doing anti ground loading or anti ship loading in the Japanese carriers, and therefore the Japanese carriers probably would have been a lot more effective. Like the big Alpha strike they send at Midway probably would have been sent um, <laughs> would have probably been sent into. Uh, at the American carriers, which probably wouldn't have been all that good for the American carriers. But again, it's kind of one of those things you really need to war game out. <coughs> um, Mr. Duckhead oh, <laughs> saying, imagine walking past Drac in the supermarket, not even knowing who he is. Um, plenty of people do that. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been recognised in a supermarket yet. Um, I've recognised in a couple of other places, which is slightly weird for me. But yeah, no, no one's walked past me in a supermarket and said, "Hey, that's Drac." To be fair, the fact that I usually do supermarket runs in a plague doctor mask or a face hugger mask these days probably helps conceal my identity more than anything else. And you know, most people tend to stay away from a man who's in the process of being. Uh, consumed by a leather face hugger in a supermarket but you know that's kind of the point <laughs> um uh, right uh kilgore what do you think if the u.s had managed to hold on to wake island and if they sent the reinforcements at the right time they sent reinforcements as early as they could. In fact, they had reinforcement groups on their way before the war even broke out. It's just the Japanese showed up with superior forces and the Admiral in charge, I think, made the right call that, you know, one carrier that's partly loaded down with reinforcement aircraft and has virtually no fighter group of its own at this point um, probably isn't going to do, do the best fighting two Japanese carriers. <laughs> so he decided to withdraw. I don't think there's... I mean, if they'd managed to somehow hold on to Wake Island, I mean, it's not the world's most dramatic outpost, um, to be perfectly honest. The, the, maybe Midway would have been Wake Island too. Who knows? But, you know, it's just one of those things. Um, it, for, for the Japanese, seizing places like Wake or trying to take Midway is more about putting roadblocks in the path of the American counterattack than it is about actually just having them. Um, Galdar Iono, show us those masks. Um, uh, where am I? Um, my face hugger mask is currently in the car, so unless you want a five minute pause while I get up out of my seat, go outside, open the car up, get the face hugger mask and come back again, that's not happening. Um, I think, though, um, where are my plague Do doctor masks? I think they're over there. Possibly. I haven't, I haven't worn the plague doctor masks that recently because it's been really hot. The face hugger mask is better for the heat. Maybe I'll, I'll try and remember that for the next stream. Uh, maybe I'll start the stream as in my guise as a. Uh, Renaissance era plague doctor, that'd be quite funny. Um, thank you, V8 Muffler Boy. Um, and you are being timed out. Um, Pl 
Excuse me, now oh, I'm running out of voice. Plasma burn death. Did any world, Navy in World War One or World War Two use decoy pretend emulated explosions, smoke, etc., on ships or near them to throw off enemy gun sights by faking in them into thinking they had the range? They didn't use sort of fake explosives or whatever to simulate shell hits to throw off enemy targeting. Um, for for one thing, it, that would actually be spectacularly difficult to do because for most um, navies, the data for their guns was very well known. So if they knew, let's say, that I'm firing at 18,000 yards with a 12-inch gun, they would then know their time of flight is, let's say, using a completely arbitrary figure, let's say it's, we know our time of flight is 25 seconds. So you'll have someone, as soon as the gun's fired, they start a stopwatch, and then at 25 seconds they look for shell splashes. If they see a bunch of random fake shell splashes, say, 20 seconds after they fired the guns, they know that's not their gunfire. Um, and so, the, and, unless you know the ballistic characteristics of the enemy guns and also have the world's best timing, you're not going to fool them just on that, that note. Plus, of course, you know, to create a shell splash the size of a 12-inch shell detonating, you need a amount of explosives comparable to a 12-inch shell that can detonate. So um, you probably don't want... want like if you've got something that can deploy that amount of explosive, you probably want it deploying it towards the enemy. They did use smoke, though. They did lay smoke to try and throw off the enemy's um, solution by hiding in a smokescreen. Um, yes, Grey Ghost, that was the correct email to send it to. Obviously, I'm not going to be reading my emails whilst I'm doing this. Um, <laughs> Black Death for Eternity asks, would the war being dragged on if Midway didn't go well for the US mean a chance of atomic bombs being used on Japanese naval forces? Um... I don't think so, no. Mainly because however far the war has progressed or not progressed by 1945, if Midway didn't go well for the US with the knock-on effects that that might entail, the Japanese Navy really did not have much left by the top of 1945. So even if you're still fighting Iwo Jima or Okinawa or maybe even a step back from that, Saipan or something when the atomic bombs arrive, the Japanese Navy is pretty much going to be a spent force unless the Japanese have been uncharacteristically conservative with what they've been doing with it. Um, Momar Diop says, the question was more geared towards unit commanders receiving transfers from the Kido Battalion, sailors serving alongside the survivors. Certainly they would have put two and two together. Um... there weren't that many <laughs> unit commanders from the sunken vessels left to transfer. Um, yes, they did put together two and two to a certain degree, but to be honest, uh, again, as, as John Parshall was saying, the amount of propaganda that was going out about the amount of losses that were inflicted on the US was massively high. And being a carrier air battle, there's not really a lot that you can, that any crew of various ships would be able to say or even know to gainsay that. So if, and remember, the Japanese pilots thought that they'd sunk a couple, several American carriers during the course of, of the battle. So even, even if it was, oh, well, I was in the hangar deck crew and the pilots told me this, they would be kind of supporting what the, <clears throat> the what the propaganda was. So most of the Japanese survivors of Midway, whilst they would obviously be saying, well, yes, I was on this carrier and it was sunk, they would kind of be following that up with, but we sank X number of American carriers and shot down Y number of American planes in exchange, 
therefore you know it's an honorable victory something or something like that so yeah i they they there would have been more knowledge that perhaps there were slightly more japanese vessels sunk than was being publicly admitted to but i don't think overall it would have made that much of an impact on morale <clears throat> um Uh. <clears throat> right. Da -da -da. <laughs> uh, where are we? Sorry. Andreas Glad, why why do you wear a mask? Well, I'm not going to get into the whole COVID politics of things, but uh, simply put, I understand the principles of aerosolized dispersion. <laughs> As an engineer, that is one of the things you learn about just from general building health, apart from anything else. Um, plus, you know, um, leather masks, such as my face hugger mask and my plague doctor mask, physically can't transmit anything through them because they're leather. Um, there's a whole interesting system for involving the tail with the um, face hugger mask that takes advantage of that but anyway um duh, 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 duh. <clears throat> Karl von Gazenberg um some Austro-Hungarian coastal fortresses pulled that fake explosion trick of the French on the French navy as von Trapp wrote in to the last sloop that's far more easy to pull off because you know if you've got a f land based fortress you can plant charges well in advance because you're not going anywhere. <laughs> um, <clears throat> slightly harder on a ship where you're you're moving along. Um, okay, that's three hours gone. So I'm going to wrap it up with a handful of handful of more questions, and then I'm going to go and get myself a well-earned break. I think. Tizona Collada, have you seen the Great War of Archimedes movie? No, not yet. Um, I probably will try to at some point when I get the chance. Um, Kilgore, if what happens if Admiral Macau attacks the US transports off Guadalcanal after Savo Island? Um, he will probably succeed because the transports are there. Um, Admiral Turner and Admiral Crutchley have no idea really what's going on until things start exploding. Possibly HMAS Australia is sunk. It, a, a lot of it is going to come down to what does HMAS Australia do? Um, with a little bit more advanced warning, because, you know, they've seen things exploding, um, Australia would be battle ready and waiting. So that's a plus for them. On the other hand, Australia is only one heavy cruiser. Macau has a lot more. Um, so Australia would probably be able to put some da significant damage down on one or two Japanese ships, but it would be overwhelmed in relatively short order just by the sheer numbers of of Japanese vessels. The big question then would be, would Mikawa continue to press on, or would he think that perhaps something else is going on here? Because remember, there's also Admiral Scott um, with the third group of um, ships, including a, an Atlanta class, waiting off to one side. So if if Australia's putting up a fight and Scott sees the Japanese passing on their way to Australia and he's flanking them with lots of five-inch fire, Macau might decide that there's clearly a second line of enemy ships waiting for him and it's time to retire, um, at which point the transports are saved, possibly at the cost of one or more additional um, Allied cruisers. If, on the other hand, he just blows through them anyway and sinks the transports, that could have quite a detrimental impact on the Guadalcanal campaign, because at this point they still haven't offloaded all of their supplies and the campaign is in its earlier stages, so the Japanese still have relatively well-supplied troops, so they might be able to use that supply shortage on the American side to try and to take Henderson Field, potentially. But it, the attack still could fail. Um... Cow Two Face, how do you hide that amount of CV losses? By not telling anyone. If the crew are deployed to other parts of the operational theatre and there's sensors guarding the ability to write what you can write home, and you know the losses have happened thousands of miles from home, 
how are people at home going to know? Yeah, sure, the carriers haven't come back, but they could be elsewhere doing other things, and to be honest, e even as far as the carriers returning to port, there are numerous, there's a few different Japanese ports, but only the people in those ports are going to see them not coming back and might assume they've gone to another port, or might assume that they're being ha still on operation, being repaired in further away bases like truck. Um, it's actually in World War Two very easy to conceal these kinds of things if you if you have the right infrastructure in place. Um, Tipo's God, what do you th think if the Germans help the Japanese Navy? Do you think anything will go different? Yes, the Royal Navy would rejoice if the Kriegsmarine up sticks and tries and skedaddled the long way. I mean, where even would they go? Probably have to go down the Atlantic, round the southern tip of South America, and strike out across the Pacific. Because you're definitely not going to fight your way through the Mediterranean, the Suez Canal. You're probably not going to fight your way across the Indian Ocean because the British can move to intercept you from the Mediterranean. So yeah, you're going to have to go. You're going to have to chance going down the South Atlantic and then across the Pacific on a gradual northwest course and hope no one intercepts you. If the Germans want to send the Kriegsmarine off to die doing that, the Royal Navy is going to be very happy about it, and the few bat survivors that reach Japan, if any, not really going to help Japan all that much. Um, yeah, it's just it, it's not going to happen. Um, Skyfix did the Yamato have radar later on in its career? Yes. Um, it had air search radar, which could be used to a limited degree for surface search, but it didn't have fire control radar. Um, Grey Ghost, would the Japanese have been better off swapping their, all their 5 inch duels to all dual 100mm guns? Yes, if they had the production time and the shipyard space to construct those, um, to, do, to actually do those swaps. Um, that would definitely help because the 100mm gun was very, very good. Um, the five inch on the Japanese side, not so much. <laughs> the Rapper 10,000, do you think your submarines could have made a bigger impact at Midway? In theory, but um, it's it still falls under the problem that all submarines have when attacking enemy fleet formations of the fleet is moving at a speed considerably greater than your sub can do on the surface, let alone what you can do underwater. So you basically have to rely on the fleet almost running you over, which is difficult enough to pull off in the North Sea or the North Atlantic, let alone the wide open expanses of the Pacific. Um, so, yeah, in theory, but I wouldn't be holding my breath. Um... and okay let's do one okay two more questions and then I'm, I'm wrapping up um david wright will you ever do a video about uss robin yes i actually have one planned in the works for this year which will be quite entertaining um hopefully and hope everyone will like it and let's see what's one last bit uh, okay two more questions i guess uh, big man Inc., any comments on montemayor's work um by and large my policy on this channel is not to comment on other youtubers work unless it's exceptionally bad, which his work is not, um, or um, unless I am in contact with and know the channel uh, owner dash creator relatively well, then I'll feel then I feel happy to comment on their work if asked and equally they can comment on mine. Um, obviously anyone can comment on mine, it's not exactly like I can control them, but um, I've not spoken to or had communication with Montemayor. I've had a look at his uh, Midway video, and I, I quite like it. The quality of the animation and narration is pretty, pretty darn good. Um, but as I say, I don't have any particular contact with him, and so my personal stance is that in those circumstances, I don't feel 
particularly fair to, you know, start commenting one way or the other on particular videos, etc., other than to say that, um, broadly speaking, for the videos that I've seen, I think are pretty good. So I, I'll, I will leave it at that. I haven't seen all of them, obviously, though. Um... Uh, Captain Seafort, this will be my, the last question for the day. Um, given John Parshall's comments earlier about the inaccessibility of Japanese language sources in World War II, what is your view on the importance of Corbett's history of the Russo-Japanese War, given that it was heavily based on Japanese intelligence and after-action reports? Um, it, it, it's pretty important. Um, I mean, to be honest, Corbett's work on the Russo-Japanese War, regardless of the fact it's it's based on Japanese um, reports and also on Royal Navy observers who were with the Japanese fleet and their reports. It's very important because the Russo... I mean, obviously all wars have two sides, but the Russo-Japanese war has two very different sides. And um, we have a reasonable amount of Russian sources on describing their thoughts on the second... Pacific Squadron, its voyage and the Battle of Tsushima, both from people who were there on board the ships, uh, from inquiries that were made afterwards, letters and books and sources and stuff, the material from the Russian archives. Obviously, it's not in English, so getting hold of that, especially during the Cold War, was very difficult. But, you know, books, fairly comprehensive books have been written since that have extracted a lot of material from the Russian side of things. But it's also equally important to have the view from the Japanese Navy side of things. And so, and I, I think this is one of the things w with the Russo-Japanese War in particular, being able to look at this is how one side saw the progress of the war, this is how the other side saw the progress of the war, e and then compare and contrast and try and come to some kind of understanding of what probably actually happened and why, it is it is a very important thing to have. Now, the thing is, obviously, if you are Russian or Japanese, you probably have access to vastly more material about that war than us as or myself as a Western historian. And obviously, I'm commenting from the perspective of an English speaking historian here. So um, for better or worse, Britain tends to be involved in an awful lot of the, the big naval conflicts for the past few hundred years, so there's usually something written in English by uh, someone or other about, you know, m most naval conflicts, you know, because we were kind of either responsible for or involved in a lot of them. <laughs> um, and so the Russo-Japanese War is a slightly odd one in that it's a very major naval conflict in relatively historically wise relatively recent times that we weren't directly involved in at which point having something like Corbett's work um, is very important but then I suppose at the same time you could equally turn around if you were say Russian or Japanese or Chinese or Italian or Spanish or whatever and look at the look at the sort of the, the resources you've got on the wars that your nation was involved in and then look across at say like I'm, I'm fairly sure for example Italian language sources on the war of 1812 are probably going to be relatively thin on the ground um <laughs> so that's I guess that could be a rough analogy for how how an Italian who's interested in that war would be looking at reports from both the US and the UK, the same way that I would be looking at reports from Russia and Japan for the Russo-Japanese War. Um, so, yeah. There you go. Um, so, yeah, other than that, I think um, I am going to wrap it up there. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Thank you very much for all uh, all of you who turned out to support and listen to John Parshall. That was really appreciated. Um uh, he, as you, you probably tell, he could see he is an absolutely wonderful, wonderful guy, as well as a wonderful historian. 
and uh, as I say, hopefully we will be working on uh, on another little project a little bit later on in the year. So thanks very much, everyone, and I will see you again in another video and uh, the Patreon live stream. The next live stream is going to be on Friday the 2nd at 7 o'clock UK time. Uh, so that will be when obviously I'm going to be going through Patreon alternate history kind of questions and then um, and then taking questions from the chat like I've been just now. So don't worry the legacy. Um, once this is all wrapped up it will be available in my live streams playlist for everybody to see afterwards. So see you around everybody uh, and have a good have a good evening or morning or whatever time period it is where you are.